If you are online, we'd love for you to type your name and affiliation in the chat. That's our surrogate sign-in sheet. If you are in the room in person, we invite you to sign in at the table, the entrance, the table near the entranceway. Um, we do have some requirements for uh, recording who attends our meetings under the Federal Advisory Committee Act. So that's the way you can help us. Sign in in person at the entry table or sign in in chat if you are with us online. In addition, I want to let you know that we do record all of all our HAB meetings. So there is a, a recording going. Um, I don't want you to be surprised um, about that. So with that, I'm going to hand off to your chair, Steve Wigman, who will ultimately hand off to the DDFO so we can start. Good morning. I wanna thank everybody that is in the room for being in the room. We like it when you're in the room and uh, hopefully in the future, the room will get even fuller. We also appreciate the folks who needed to do this online. <clears throat> we have a lot to uh, talk about today and tomorrow. And uh, wow. <laughs> take two. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, we've got a lot to cover and um, we need to uh, express our appreciation to members who have been with the board for a long time, who are transitioning off and turn the mantle over to the next leadership. It's important that uh, we think about moving forward and we have uh, an opportunity to have interim leadership during this period when the next package is being approved. <clears throat> With that, I'll uh, introduce Mike Birkenbile, also known as Mikey, depends on how long you know him. Uh, he's our new DDFO, Deputy Designated Federal Official. And uh, I've chatted with him a couple of times and find him to be articulate and interesting and well-informed on processes and the doings of things. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, good morning and welcome to the June 2022 Hanford Advisory Board meeting. Uh, Steve indicated, my name is Mike Birkenbile. I am the Deputy Designated Federal Officer for the Hanford site. As a reminder, this meeting will be conducted in accordance with the requirements of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, advisory committees, have played an important role in shaping programs and policies of the federal government. The Hanford Advisory Board's role to provide policy level advice and recommendations concerning the following EM site specific issues, such as cleanup activities and environmental restoration, waste and nuclear materials management and disposition, excess facilities, future land use and long-term stewardship, risk management and communications. I appreciate your attendance today and I look forward to the Hanford Advisory Board's development and submission of constructive, actionable policy level advice on Hanford cleanup. Thank you. Back to you, Steve. All right. Maybe go over the agenda? Yeah, let's, let's review the agenda and uh, get started. All right. Um, a couple of things to note before we do the agenda. If you have a computer with you, make sure the sound is turned off on your computer so you're using the microphones at the table or we will get some delightful feedback. Oh, and turn the volume all the way down on your computer as well. So the, the audio in and out of your device is off. So we're using the microphones. Um, if you're in the room and wish to speak, it's been a long time since we did this in person and those who've been around know this, those who are new might not. If you wanna speak, take your name card and stick it up like this. And so we keep a cue of who wants to speak between the chat 
and your name cards. So if you're online, let us know in chat if you wanna jump in and ask a question. Um, and if you need to fiddle, there are pipe cleaners on the table for those who need to fidget. This is not licorice. <laughs> I thought it might be. It is not, it is not edible. Um, so what we're gonna do today, we're gonna start off with TPA agency updates, which is our normal habit. We're gonna recognize um, members who are rotating off of the board. We're going to have elections for interim chair and vice chair of the HAB. Um, and we will explain the whys and wherefores of that before lunch. Voting will be done over a period of time, not all at once in a five minute block. Um, so you'll have lunch and part of the afternoon to register your preference. This afternoon, we're gonna talk about the CERCLA five-year review um, with DOE and EPA and how those, that progress is going. And we will end the day talking about the HAB work plan for fiscal year 2023. Mm -hmm. Fiscal 2023 starts October 1st in 2022. Um, and that's gonna set the dates for your meetings and an outline of topics and work basically for the coming year. And I must have an echo, sorry about that. Questions on what we're gonna do um, today. Tomorrow we're gonna have committee reports and look ahead to what's coming up in August and September. All right. With that, Keep going? Okay. With that, I'm trying to find the right document. We have a lot of documents going on. We're gonna look at, why can't I find it? Okay. The board meeting minutes from your last meeting. So the first act of the board is to adopt the minutes from the last meeting. That was in March. They were in your packet. Are there questions or suggestions to improve the meeting minutes from March? Anyone? I'm hearing a lot of quiet. It's good. Are you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen? Okay. Yes, we have a quorum. <laughs> Had to check that. Um, are there any objections to adopting the meeting minutes from March? All right, Mr. Chairman. I think they're adopted. You okay with that? I'm okay with that. They're adopted. Right. In the record. Everybody read them. Okay. So, when you have time. When you have time. So what that does, are there any announcements before we jump into TPA agency updates? I didn't have any on my tickler file, but okay. So if you need it, there is both coffee and things to nibble on over here and over here. Um, by the generosity of a number of Susans who have made things for your delight. And with that, you ready, Brian? Always. Always. Okay, let me get...
good. We're good. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, the opportunity today. I appreciate the ability to do this in, in person. Um, the department and our contractor partners continue to deliver great progress across the site um, safely and consistently, um, which across a very broad range of activities, as you, as you recognize. Um, there will continue to be challenges uh, as we execute our, our complex and challenging mission. But really the teamwork that we've developed over the last few years through the pandemic has, has been pivotal, pivotal um, for some recent successes. And I think it sets the stage very well for what we have um, in front of us with the site cleanup uh, moving forward. Um, for the first time in a long time, I have not included a COVID slide in my presentation. I'll be happy to answer questions um, relative to COVID as we get into the conversation and the follow on discussion. Um, we do continue to see uh, implications of uh, impacts to the supply chain, uh, periodic impacts in, uh, in workforce um, availability and personnel, but the contractors continue to do a very good job of working around those issues, anticipating issues, putting mission mitigations in place uh, to continue to progress the mission of the site. And, and I think you'll see some of that as we get into the presentation today. If you go to the next slide, please. So as, as always, we start with our top priority besides uh, for our top cleanup priority, our top priority remains the health and safety of the workforce. Our top cleanup priority um, is really to continue towards the delivery of direct feed low activity waste. Um, we started campaign two at the tank side season remo removal system on the 18th of June, and we're approaching 300,000 gallons of waste prepared for the waste treatment plant when vitrification operations are uh, ready to begin. Um, we learned a lot of important lessons for the through the first cycle, first full cycle of Tisker, which takes us from operations through ion exchange columns, swap out, and preparations for the next the next campaign. And West Bryan and the WRPS team did a phenomenal job of capturing those issues. Um, making system enhancements, making software enhancements, making procedure and process enhancements, training enhancements. Um, as we work towards that eventual period of time when the TISCA will be supporting waste treatment plant operations, really to make sure we get into a fluid, um, very efficient process through the full cycle of every uh, TISCA campaign. Um, we'll continue to look for new opportunities every cycle, um, but at this point, we remain on track to have a million gallons staged prior to the start of Tisker operations, uh, or I'm sorry, waste treatment operations late next year. And a couple of the pictures you see up there on the left is the uh, the hookup related to the ion exchange columns. And on the right is the ion exchange or the, the, the forklift that moves the columns from the Tisker enclosure out to the enclosure pad. Um, really a lot of great lessons learned this cycle and the team did a phenomenal job. And as I said, on our way to 300,000 gallons, on our way to a million gallons as uh, we prepare for waste treatment plant operations next year. Uh, next slide. Um, at the waste treatment plant, um, Val McCain, uh, Rick Holmes and the team worked through some challenges with the plant cooling water system. Um, I think I mentioned those challenges in the last, the last time we had a, a Hanford advisory board meeting um, pleased to say that the system's back in operation has been for about a week and a half, um, performing very well with the modifications installed uh, to address the issues that were identified in the system um, when it was uh, we had some some challenges with a couple of the, the pumps. Um, really, the seamless teamwork between the department and the contractors was the part that I was most gratified to see. Um, I was out about six weeks ago as they were working through the final corrective actions, and had I not known who was DOE, who was contractor, um, you couldn't, you wouldn't have been able to tell. Uh, the team worked really very, very seamlessly through that process. And um, it, was, it was really important for me to see and to recognize that the focus we placed on uh, teamwork collaboration, sort of that strive to operational, um, oper operationalizing the site um, as we prepare for direct feed low activity waste um, has really um, taken effect and is, is really being demonstrated as we work through our way through the, some of the challenges we face in the delivery of the machine. Um, across the plant, 
uh, testing continues uh, to support the startup uh, of the heat up of the first melter later this summer. Um, our approach relative to the commissioning program overall is not to focus on just the next event in the commissioning cycle, but focus on uh, operations um, and, and really creating an, an environment of operational excellence as we transition to operations um, late next year and into the into 2024. Um, and we've really gotten a lot of great support from both Bechtel and Amentum, bringing in corporate leaders with experience in large operational facilities, refineries, um, you know, certainly commercial nuclear power plants, um, lots of Navy folks running around as, as, you know, from my experience as well, just to help the team transition into that operational culture that really hasn't been seen here since the end of the national security mission in late, late, you know, late eighties. Um, while we do operations here, um, the operational pace of the entire site, because direct feed activity waste is site-wide machine, will will continue to increase over time, and and our site culture and team and teamwork, collaboration, communication, have to operate faster than the site operates to continue to safely execute the mission, and and we're on a very good solid path for that. Um, I appreciate the corporate support. I appreciate the support we get from our own team and, and the time spent by each of our leaders out on the site as well. Um, and the pictures you see uh, on the on the left is the uh, exhaust system, um, exhaust treatment treatment system going through its paces. Um, and and what I think is is should be obvious, but is not always is when we get into the you know the, we transition to heating up the first melter. Um, effectively, the plant is in full operational status. And um, so all of the systems, all of the teamwork, all the proficiencies, all the procedures have to be in place. Um, and the culture will evolve as the machine uh, comes to life. Um, and, and we've seen really great progress. Uh, on the right, you can see some of the work that went on with the plant cooling water system modifications. Uh, we ultimately had to make modifications in the bay itself to straighten flow. Uh, we we uh, Bechtel did a great job working with the vendors. Had two of the pumps refurbished ahead of schedule uh, and delivered for installation. And what you partially see there is a a, a basically a skid mounted system that is a backup to the installed systems as we work through a number of contingencies. All of those processes and going through those with this team will be helpful from an experience perspective as we get you know, closer and closer and then into operations of the plant because we're gonna deal with challenges on a big machine fairly routinely. We want them to be small and hand it, handled um, efficiently, but these experiences will galvanize the team and prepare the site for this ultimate transition and the site and the team did a great job through a, through a pretty challenging situation. Uh, next slide. Um, as you recognize, as we've briefed many times, direct feed low activity waste is not just about the waste treatment plant, it's not just about the tank farms. Um, it includes effluent treatment facility, liquid effluent retention facility, um, and, and certainly, as you see here, the in integrated disposal facility and utilities, which I'll talk about in later slides. But we've got multiple projects um, ongoing across all of our facilities, um, all at that aim point in time when direct feed activity waste operations are, are expected to begin late next calendar year. You can see the effluent treatment facility is going through a number of significant upgrades. This is really the final outage that they'll go through prior to um, the start of direct feed activity waste. And they're, they're on schedule and making great progress. Um, work is also progressing at the to install the fourth uh, basin at the liquid, liquid effluent retention facility. Um, and at the integrated disposal facility, uh, work continues on the leachate collection tank with liner replacements. Um, and there's a cooling um, pad that's being installed, um, started yesterday. I was out on the site yesterday to see that begin, which is, is really that last, last construction activity at the integrated disposal facility where the glass canisters will sit and cool prior to be placed into the, into the landfill itself. Um, so they're making great progress there. And, and certainly we're continuing to work with ecology across the entire spectrum of permits to make sure that we execute the plan and schedule um, that we have in place with the, with the help of ecology and the, and the delivery of permits on time. And, and I think we're getting great support. Um, 
at all of the supporting facilities, we continue to focus on the transition to operations. Um, when we get into the operation of direct feed activity waste, no individual activity can shut down um, without impacting the others. And so it's, it's sort of a collaboration effort, even for outages um, and things like that. Everything's got to function together. And that's where the teamwork really comes in and where we've transitioned to an enterprise model of the site. You know, we're two DOE offices or multiple contractors, all multiple contract types. But at the end of the day, one team, one site, one mission, and, and DF Law really creates the opportunity for us to pull that all together and, and drive to that next level performance that we'll, we'll certainly be ready for when it's time to make that transition into plant operations. Um, I wanted to take a couple minutes now to talk about the, the there was a consent of Korea amendment that was issued um, by the department to the court last Friday. Just to give a little context to that, um, you know, we spent at the early, in the early days of the pandemic, we worked closely with Ecology um, and the state to develop um, a force majeure approach to recognize the implications of the pandemic um, to give appropriate re relief to consent decree milestones. Um, for certain milestones associated with some of the aspects of, of the plant that are not really tied to listed negotiations right now. Um, that overall process and the formula was tied to site population and remobilization and reentry. And so when we got to the point where, as you remember, we began remobilization in May of 2020. Um, and by the end of September 2020, we had achieved what we had framed as our phase two remobilization, which we had all the non-portable workers back on site. Those that could telework were largely teleworking um, through from that point until March of 2022, when the department completed its re-entry with our contractors, a full re-entry into a hybrid workplace in what we were operating in today. At that point, we worked with the state to verify the calculation that we had applied um, and that the, the number is 579 days that was applied to, that would be applied to the consent decree milestones. And, and really um, we, we took that effort just to preserve the department's legal rights, but also in recognition of the challenges we had faced. Um, and we decided it was appropriate and timely and transparent to make those uh, adjustments to the consent decree um, right away when, frankly, when the pandemic was still fresh in everyone's mind and not wait till later in the year or later next year. Um, now that that is the consent decree piece and the milestones. When we talk about how we operate the site, the project schedules, the site schedule, they have no connection to those consent decree milestones. Just because the milestones change does not mean that the entire schedule expands to fill the time. We are still working uh, towards the delivery of the direct feedlot activity waste program, hot commissioning uh, by the end of 2023. Uh, we remain on track for that today. It's a success oriented schedule as most of our schedules are, um, but the department and our contractors are committed to continue to progress that effort. And what I'm hopeful of is that all of you have seen the progress that we delivered over the last several years, despite the pandemic, in progressing the mission, um, we effectively fielded and started operations at Tisker during the pandemic. Bechtel completed construction and startup activities during the pandemic. Many of the upgrades in the facilities that support um, the DFL program uh, were, were progressed during the pandemic. And so, you know, we, we remain committed to progress safely towards that that goal that we have to start tank waste treatment at the end of 2023. And we'll continue to work um, aggressively, safely to achieve that objective together. Uh, next slide. So now we'll jump over to the risk reduction part of the Hanford mission. As I think you recognize the site mission is incredibly diverse. I think we had an opportunity to show the deputy secretary um, some of that yesterday. Um, and there's projects really across the site that continue to progress very well. Groundwater program uh, is on track to treat 2 billion gallons again in FY22. 
the last number I saw was 1.7 billion at the end of the last month. So we're well on track. Um, and that's the seventh or eighth year in a row. Uh, this is drilling season. So we've got at least seven active drill drilling sites going right now to optimize the locations of those extraction wells. So we continue to maximize the benefits of the groundwater program. And what you see in the picture is a, a, a flushing activity near K East reactor, which is helpful in accelerating some of the, the motive force of pushing the contaminants, the chromates, chromium out of the soil column into groundwater where we have a very robust groundwater extraction program. And it's a process that we've used other places periodically across the site to accel accelerate the contamination cleanup of the of groundwater. So um, really good progress there. Um, just started that K East uh, flushing, I think within the last two weeks. And so we'll continue to monitor that and progress uh, the mission there. Um, at Waste Encapsulation and Storage Facility, uh, we continue to make the facility modifications um, to support the uh, eventual transfer of 1,936 cesium strontium capsules out of wet storage and into dry cask storage, similar to what civilian commercial nuclear power plants do with their spent fuel. Um, the uh, transfer equipment testing is progressing. I actually went out to Highline, feels like it was a week or two ago, it was probably a month or two ago to look at the process. Um, they're, they're making very good progress in what is seemingly a simple transition process, but when we're talking about the radiation level associated with those capsules, uh, there's nothing simple about that. Um, we have the mock-up uh, that's a full-scale replica of the G-cell, um, and we'll have a, a, a cast there as well um, at the um, massive facility. And as the equipment goes from our, our manufacturer into the mock-up facility uh, to confirm testing, once the testing and procedures are validated, the final um, facility um, equipment will go into manufacturing as we continue to hone and practice the operations. Uh, Mock-ups at the Hanford site are immensely um, helpful, uh, and, and we've seen great benefits from mock-ups with the sludge project, uh, with the 324 building project, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, and also I know they'll be very helpful when we talk about the waste encapsulation storage facility project. Um, and the pad that was constructed during the pandemic, one thing that's, that's outstanding is sensor installation, and that's one example where we had some supply chain issues um, won't impact the overall schedule for Westif, but um, it is a reflection of the fact that we we are seeing some supply chain weakness in certain areas. Um, the last picture is a 224B um, deactivated in 1950s. Right now we've got some characterization debris um, removal in progress, really ultimately to set conditions uh, for demolition in the future. But just one of the other activities we routinely go through with a lot of the aging facilities to assess and ultimately set conditions for future demolition. Uh, next slide, uh, 324 building. Um, we're working this week on the 11th of 13 micropiles. Becky might have an update on that, um, but um, I think we, we were able to get through some technical issues. And those are the, the, the micropiles are basically the soil column pillars that will be tied to the structure. So when we undermine the structure to remove soil, um, this, this structure won't um, flex in any way. Uh, we're also in the process of doing so horizontal sta soil stabilization activities um, and preparations inside the activities continue. As I think you recognize and should recognize, the key transition point for the project is where we cut the B cell floor and start to expose the, the you know, the, the contaminated materials, the, radi the rad levels in that B cell increase dramatically. Uh, and, and really the materials in there, the John Deere excavator arms um, will start to degrade in an accelerated way. When I was at the project in, in my former life, um, we did a, ver a number of studies to validate that the equipment would last through the entire um, removal sequence. Um, but but the, I'm, I'm confident that the team has contingency measures should a, an excavator um, expire during the process before that we're done. We have the facility over at the mock-up to draw part, pieces, parts from, and we can go in and repair and replace and continue to execute the mission. So 324 building continues to make good progress, and um, we're, we're pleased with um, the lessons learned in the last few years being applied and, and really safe and effective progress being delivered. Um, K-East um, cocooning, 
It's really exciting whenever there's a skyline change at the Hanford site. So we're really excited about this, the, the steel enclosure going up. Um, actually, Ike's out there today with Brian Sticky and some others to walk work their way through the K base and K, K, K East K West because that was a we didn't have time to take the deputy out there yesterday. Um, but the team has done a phenomenal job and they're on track to complete this effort uh, by the end of the year. And you know, for for me, it's um, just seeing the skyline change, seeing the progress being made on the seventh of eight eight reactors that will be cocooned at the Hanford site um, is really pretty exciting. Um, and what you don't see is a, a lot of the earthwork around the the K East K West reactors. Um, it it feels like a big dig because of the underground piping being removed, things like that. Um, but you can see on the lower picture demolition of the K West fuel storage bunker. Um, continue to make good progress inside of the basin with characterization of, of waste and debris and um, just good progress on, on some challenging projects. And 100K is one of those areas that, you know, if you look at the river corridor, 100K, 324 are really the last big um, dem de demolition projects um, on, on the river corridor after the 300 area was fully remediated in the last decade. So we're really pleased to see, along with the great performance of the pump and treat program, the progress um, at K Basin and 100K overall. Uh, next slide. Um, things we don't always talk about, but I think are important to highlight periodically. The upper left picture is a, a new multi-craft maintenance facility that went into operations this spring. So it'll ha house pipe fitters, carpenters, painters, electricians, millwrights, instrument techs, all in one facility um, so they can actually, you know, we can see efficiencies from that, WRPS can see efficiencies from that. And the team is in, in a much better condition than they were in. I walked through the old facilities that they were in, which were kind of a hodgepodge of old repurposed facilities that in some cases didn't have installed heating um, and just didn't really represent um, an, an opportunity for that team to fulfill their important function in an efficient way. So um, good to see this facility now in operation. The ribbon cutting was I think in March or April. Um, and, and I think we'll see some positive efficiencies there as well as certainly team morale. Um, the lower or the, the right side is a new uh, office facility for 222S lab personnel, replacing a 50 year old facility. Um, and, and really part of our overall plan to bring each of our teams, contractors um, up to uh, the positioned well for supporting DF law when DF law is ready to begin next year. So um, glad to see this facility continue to progress and it's important and they've made good progress. And then last one is the Central Plateau class picture. Central Plateau water treatment facility drove by yesterday, still making good, good progress on the, on the construction, expect the facility to be placed into operation um, middle of next year. And uh, it's replacing the 1940s vision water version vintage water plant um, that continues to support the site. The new plant is, is you know, current technology, cur current, you know, maintainability, operability, enhancements and ultimately provides expansion capability for the water needs of the site over the next several decades. So we were pleased to get this construction moving. Um, and, and these are only a couple of those projects. Uh, we have um, a number of other projects that we're working to optimize our infrastructure. Uh, the 400 area fire station, uh, which was planned to replace the 300 area fire station that has been in this, at the site since 1959. Um, we had uh, bidders out on the site um, a month or two ago, and we're expecting proposals for that new construction of the new foreign area fire station. Ultimately, when the 100K area is complete, we will no longer need the 100 area fire station, the, 100, the fire station in the northern part of the site, and we'll neck down to two uh, in the 200 um, area fire station, foreign area fire station. Um, I was out within the last two weeks, walking through all the fire stations. And, um, you know, the team has done a very good job of maintaining those facilities, but they're old. And we certainly want to uh, provide a place where the firefighters can train and be prepared to support the important mission of the site 
uh, with facilities that that represent the uh, the current standard in the world. And and we're pleased to see that progress there with the with the solicitation moving forward by HMS. Um, we're continuing to work the project to refurbish the North Loop with Bonneville Power Administration. Um, it's a little complicated because of the timing of the delivery of that capability it has to align with Energy Northwest outages. So we're working to have everything complete by May of 2025. So at the completion or during the transition, during the outage um, at Energy Northwest refueling outage, we'll be able to put the new North Loop into service. And it's an enhancement to the reliability of electrical distribution, which as you recognize is pretty important when you have uh, melters that operate on electrical power and melters need power to stay molten and hot and a, a melter that cools down and turns into a big rock is something we have to replace. And so we've already had conversations with Bonneville Power Administration about the transition that we're making at the site and the support and the response times we'll need from them to be able to ensure that we can continue to maintain safe operations when we have the two melters on and operating. And once some melters on, it's on. Um, so we're looking forward to that transition. And then we're continually assessing and conducting maintenance activities on road, sewer, power, water, IT infrastructure to ensure that the site infrastructure supports the mission infrastructure and the mission and the projects we have planned in execution. And the and HMIS team working with um, across, basically across the Hanford Enterprise team is doing a great job with all of those activities. Um, and obviously, you know, we, 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 we work closely with them to make sure that we're focusing on the right things at the right time. Uh, next slide, you know, I don't often talk about um, reten retention and recruiting, um, but, you know, as we think about the, the Hanford site, um, people represent our most important asset. And we department and our contractors, we're experiencing, experiencing attrition. Um, we have a lot of mature people at the Hanford site, as most people do, most, most workplaces do, um, choosing to retire, um, some accepting jobs elsewhere. And so we're, we're working hard with our contractors to assess the factors that um, lead people to choose to move on. Um, can't do much about retirement, but we certainly can um, identify potential opportunities relative to retention. And we're working to place a specific emphasis on sharing progress across the site on a very routine basis to provide a firmer connection of the, the mission, the successes that are being delivered across the site on a daily basis to every member of the workforce. Um, and, 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 you know, we, we think and we know that the Hanford site represents a much more important activity, endeavor, um, mission, passion, than um, other, other opportunities, you know, Amazon's been been stealing folks and I'm sure it's important to get bunny slippers from Miami to Saskatchewan in two hours faster or whatever they do. But the reality of it is it's really important for our team to, to see the connection uh, to the work that they do, to the impact of the health and safety that they're providing, not only to the Hanford workforce, but our Hanford community, and certainly also um, to the entire Pacific Northwest region. We recognize that as a site, we're the foundation for economic prosperity in the entire region. And if we don't do our job well, if we don't manage the hazards that are evident and on the site, um, and we lose any control of that, people don't wanna buy Washington apples, they don't wanna buy Washington wines, they don't wanna to move to the tri-cities with their businesses. And by celebrating success uh, on a re recurring basis, reinforcing the importance of our work um, in, a, in a much broader way than just the paycheck aspect of it. Um, we're driving to instill pride across the workforce and that will help us to not only retain, but recruit. And we see that as a powerful opportunity for us to do that. And frankly, in our approach to business, we sell the Hanford site and the importance of the mission and the unique aspects from, from a personal and professional um, challenge and development perspective. And we sell the choice Tri Cities because it's a great place to live, and and by by focusing on those two aspects, um, we 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 will continue to, I believe, attract and retain quality people to the site to further the Im important mission, and and for each of you, you know, I hope you get the word out that we're hiring, 
plenty of opportunities to work at the Hanford site, both at the department and the contractors. The contractors can hire folks a lot faster than we can. It's okay, I'll steal them later um, and bring them into the department. But bringing talent to the area is the most important thing. And I think we've, we've, we've made good progress. We had a recruiting event in early March where we, we recruit with the department, with the contractors at a joint recruiting event, over 2000 people signed up. Um, we interviewed over 1100 over a four hour block of time. And I, I know Val McCain has seen an increase in the number of applications for her positions as a result of that. So we're planning another event this fall. We'll do it again and we'll continue to do it to continue to fill um, the site with talented folks that um, are important for our uh, the future of our mission. Um, engagement remains important. Next slide. Um, you know, I think you recognize how much time I spend, the leadership team spends, the department spends um, in engagement, and we have a robust engagement activity and effort throughout the year. And certainly our effort is focused on building awareness, ultimately support, um, which ties at the end of the day to um, congressional funding. So we recognize those linkages and though we can't lobby Congress, we can certainly talk to people about the importance of the work we do, the progress we're delivering, the, the taxpayer value we're delivering, and um, that creates um, positive pressure for uh, funding for the Hanford site. Um, we have site visits now that we're open for tours. Um, we have a lot of uh, opportunities for, to bring um, community leaders, um, national leaders to our site. Um, we're going to bring, uh, we've offered two windows for our local uh, Tri-Cities um, mayors and city councils to come out and visit the site in July. Um, we've had replaced three of the four Tri-Cities mayors, which sounds internally inconsistent, but have been have changed out. And so we want to get the new mayors out here um, with their, with their um, council members to see the site. Um, we continue to maintain a very robust tribal affairs program now under the leadership of Amanda Velasquez, who joined our team uh, as the tribal program manager um, earlier in June. And we're excited to have her on board. Um, as you recognize, you also probably know, we, we um, Brian Harkins has been selected and has taken over as the assistant manager for mission support. He and Brian Stickney are, are going out to visit the tribes. Um, he, they visited the Wanapum and uh, CTUIR, working to get out to the Yakima Nez Perce. But it's part of an ongoing and a very robust engagement program we have with the tribal nations um, to ensure that we provide the opportunity for um, to hear their perspectives and, and, and share their concerns about the cleanup mission of the site. Um, the picture of Governor Inslee visiting the site, um, really a great opportunity to get the governor out and his staff um, visited the cold test facility and a, and a relatively brief visit to the waste treatment plant. Um, I rode the, the bus back with Laura Watson and the staff, and my whole focus was on enticing them to come back for a longer visit um, to see the rest of the site, because we've got a lot of great things going on across the site, and I'm hopeful I was successful, and I hope to see the governor back in a very short time, and to give us, you know, the time to show the site um, and, and give it the full day, which generally is what it takes to be able to share um, what we're doing across that broad spectrum of activities. And then again, yesterday, the deputy secretary was out with Ike White. Um, Nicole Nelson John, who's the EM3, was also out uh, yesterday. And, and we really do continue to do our very best to get people out to see the site. I can show lots of great pictures. Um, and, and without the context of seeing the size um, and of the site itself and the facilities we're talking about, um, it's, it's not quite as impactful. And the part that's always missing with these types of discussions and pictures is you, you don't get to see the team, the people out there doing the work, the relationship between the department and our contractors, the relationship between the con contractors to, together. Yesterday during the deputy's visit, um, not only at the waste treatment plant, Val McCain hosted with, you know, obviously the department's team. I also had Bob Wilkinson out there to talk about the role that HMIS plays in all the infrastructure for the waste treatment plant and direct fuel activity waste. I had Ray Geimer out there from the 222S lab to talk about the lab's role relative to DF law. And it was it was great to watch. They choreographed the discussions as we walked between buildings. They were they were talking with the deputy secretary and his team about all the things that, that we, we do. John Eschenberg had his opportunity at an integrated disposal facility. Then we went and to go into WESIF. I wanted to make sure the deputy saw not only the waste treatment plant new, but Wesif old, 
um, to get a, a perspective on, on, on the range of operations of the site. And so, you know, I really am advocating in every venue that I go to, um, to get out to the site and see it, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll find ways to get folks out. We're, we don't do site tours anymore for the general public, but for those that have an interest and have a role in the Hanford effort, we want to get you out on site to see what we've accomplished over the last couple of years. I look at this as a little bit of a site unveiling um, because I can show lots of pictures, but until you see the, the site, the team, the people, the interplay, you don't understand where the site really is. And um, I think we really have a positive story to tell. Uh, next slide. I think it's obvious, um, should be obvious, we do spend a lot of time um, focused on the environment, our mission in general, the environmental cleanup, which is the only reason the Department of Energy is here, is largely to um, continue to clean up the environment of the site. So we do um, obviously have a number of activities associated with uh, wildlife, um, you know, flora and fauna, and, you know, the cleanup effort continues to progress as well. And so, um, you drive out on the site certain times of year, there'll be buffer areas set up for nesting areas for bald eagles and uh, fruginous hawks um, and other activities out there. The waterlands area, certainly we, we take um, very seriously. Um, I was pleased that the department nominated um, the Hanford site for the 2022 Presidential Migratory Bird Federal Stewardship Award. Um, we didn't win that, the Coast Guard did something that was some, you know, obviously um, impactful as well. Um, but we continue to look for opportunities to highlight the, the focus that we have and the commitment we have to preserve the environment as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, you know, the Hanford site is not just about the cleanup. Um, not always obvious, um, but we have a number of site tenants that we work with routinely um, to mutually support each other in the important missions that we have. Um, B Reactor, we were able to resume tours at the end of May. We we're able to, you know, run tours until last week when the COVID conditions drove us into a medium and yellow, and we curtailed tours until we can return back. Um, but we had many visitors over at the site uh, at the B Reactor over Memorial Day, and thousands signed up to visit B Reactor over the summer. So we're hopeful that we can get back into um, getting folks out to see that facility. Um, I'm amazed every time I go there that it was constructed in 11 months and operated for as long as it did. And the, the, cra the craftsmanship is really impressive, given there wasn't really a nuclear industry at that point. They were the first. So um, it's certainly important for our, our site and our history. And I'm, I'm, I'll be glad to get it open again and get, get tours going again. Um, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory um, opened their exploration center in early June. Um, I was able to attend and pleased to be able to, to be part of that. Um, I've actually set up a tour of LIGO uh, with my entire leadership team. Uh, in middle of July, just to make sure we all resensitize ourselves to what LIGO does. Um, they periodically go into observation periods and I think they're looking for gravitation waves that are the width of a neutron. So a heavy truck going down the road can, can sometimes impact that. And so I wanna make sure that our entire team is sensitized to the importance of that mission and supporting that mission. Um, and, and working with LIGO to make sure that we maintain a good communications routine. Um, and also just in general, from a STEM perspective, the Exploration Center is a very nice facility. Um, and if we can get folks out there, capture their imagination about STEM, um, we need STEM folks too. And if they don't wanna work in astrophysics and whatever else black hole stuff magic goes on there, and they wanna do real engineering or other things like that, we got a place for them at Hanford. Um, and again, if they go to the lab, we'll try and steal them back later. So lots of good opportunities to, to get folks out and get into a, a career environment that, that we can benefit from. And then Energy Northwest, the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Project, um, we're the landlord for that. We executed uh, a NEPA assessment and we had to do a lease amendment to provide the coverage for uh, Energy Northwest to do, go do some characterization uh, work in, that would ultimately support an NRC license. Uh, for the reactor if it goes forward uh, at that site. Um, we worked very closely and actually coordinated the effort between Energy Northwest, um, the Office of Nuclear Energy and the Department of Energy, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Office of Clean Energy Demonstration, which is a new office um, that Todd Schrader moved over from EM2 into that office. And so 
it's always helpful to have people in high places. And so we, we coordinated the effort to make sure all the agencies were working together to get through our analysis um, to support Energy Northwest. And again, I don't know if the project will go forward. There's lots of factors that are way, way beyond what we focus on here at the site that will make that determination. And it's a Grant County project, but um, we'll continue to work closely with Energy Northwest, um, frankly, with um, Pacific Northwest National Lab, Tri-Cities Community, to look for opportunities where we can partner and um, really do things beyond the cleanup that will support the long-term uh, commitment that the department has made here from the Hanford site to PNNL and into the future. Um, this is a great place to do business and we have a lot of great, great people and a history of, you know, people doing difficult things and doing it well. There's, if I'm, if I'm a business owner, I want to, I want to be there if I have a challenge. And so that's what we want to continue to reflect back. So lastly, um, I get off the stage slide. Um, you know, our DOE and contractor team continues to make tremendous progress. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful that we're able to host those site visits again, as I mentioned, got to see it to believe it. And, and it's really about the feel. People will see this stuff, but I, I always remember the feels of places I've been. And I think it's uh, the, the energy of the site, the pride in the team is, is really all very obvious and impactful and positive um, and really is helpful for us in many, many ways. And we remain committed um, to just continue to progress this challenging mission that we have safely and efficiently, um, mass, maximize risk reduction per dollar in a resource constrained environment, all anchored on our commitment to the health and safety of the workforce um, and the Hanford community as well. So finally, you know, as, as Mike mentioned, um, we've got a lot of members um, that have been served on the Hanford Advisory Board for a long time. Um, I'd like to thank each of you for your interest and engagement in the cleanup effort at the Hanford site. Um, it's been helpful and impactful over the years, and we hope that, I certainly hope that you'll stay engaged as members of the public in the future. So with that, I'll turn it back to, um, I guess. I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, if you have questions or comments, we usually go offer all three agencies for their updates, and then we go to the queue. We call it the queue. If you're in the room, put your card up like Mike has done. Um, if you are um, online, let us know through the chat that you want to be in the queue, and we will we will get to you in that order. With that, I'm going to ecology. Stephanie, you're here. Let me get you put together. Thanks, Ruth. I'll give you a minute to get our PowerPoint pulled up. Here we go. And we will, we're going to share it properly this time. Can folks hear me okay? I see a thumbs up. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. Uh, so uh, my name is Stephanie Schleif. I'm with the Department of Ecology's Nuclear Waste Program. Uh, I'm here in lieu of David Bowen. He was hoping to be here, but he's actually over in Seattle taking part in holistic negotiations. He was there yesterday as well. Um, with me, I have Ryan Miller. He's our communications manager. He's going to help me out as we go through our PowerPoint this morning. Um, I just want to start out by saying it is echoing Brian's statements. It is so nice to be in person again to see so many friendly faces in the room. It's been two and a half years, um, which is two and a half years that I haven't had a chance to have some of Susan's baked goods. So I'm very excited that she brought those. I am definitely gonna partake. And I know Ryan also uh, had his fiance prepare some brownies. So I'll need to take some of those as well. So I'm gonna be well fed uh, here. So thank you all for um, coming today and taking part in the Hanford Advisory Board. Going on to the next slide. What we're going to talk about today, uh, a lot of what we continue to talk about at the various board meetings, we'll touch on recruitment, outreach and education, the governor's visit and funding. Uh, Brian briefly talked about the governor's visit, so we'll go into a little bit of detail. We'll update on holistic negotiations, our tri-party agreement compliance activities and compliance and permitting activities. Continuing on to the next slide, talking about recruitment. <laughs> You know, Brian talked uh, at length on this as well. 
Um, I think in the Tri-Cities area, we are all uh, competing for folks in the environmental field. Um, ecology has have been challenged probably for the whole of this calendar year uh, in getting applicants for the positions that we've had vacant, um, which has been a real challenge. It's not just the nuclear waste program, it's all of the Department of Ecology's experiencing that challenge. So we're doing our best to do extended outreach to folks, um, to share Ecology's mission, um, to share the postings that we have available right now. Uh, we are starting, I think, to see the the, the light at the end of the tunnel. We are getting some applicants now for our environmental specialist positions, which is great to see. Uh, since the last time we provided you an update, we filled nine positions. We do have 12 active recruitments, which are underway in various stages of the hiring process from, uh, you know, an offer has been made or we're conducting reference checks or interviews and the recruitment has been posted. Um, so in the same pitch that Brian made, I'm going to do the same. We have included a link in our presentation uh, to those positions that are open right now with the Department of Ecology. Um, the majority of those are environmental specialists, four or five positions. So they're not beginner positions um, for, for folks coming right out of college, but we are opening up some of our positions to in training, which does provide us the opportunity to, to hire folks that can gain experience in that role until they become cool fully qualified at the level of an environmental specialist four or five. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just share my story with the Department of Ecology. I hired on, I worked at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard as an engineer for them, and I grew up in Walla Walla, so this area has always sort of been in my heart, and I wanted to move back here and do some meaningful environmental work. Um, the nuclear waste program was actually my regulator when I worked at the, the shipyard, and they recruited me back here. I started as an environmental specialist three, a permit writer, moved into an engineering position, became a project manager, and then became the deputy program manager. So, you know, the one thing that tells folks is we do have the opportunity to sort of move around, to advance in career, and it is really just a great place to start. And I do think we have a really great mission and a good culture within our program. So with that, if you know of anyone who would be a good fit and interested in a job with the state, uh, please do go ahead and share that link with them for our open positions. Continuing on to the next slide, Ryan is going to cover the next couple of slides for us. Perfect. Thanks, uh, Stephanie. So to, to kind of start off on this slide, kind of to echo Brian's comments, Ecology is continuing you know, our regular engagement with the HAB, you know, local community, congressional, delega congressional delegation, you know, the Oregon Hamper Clamp Board tribes and, and other groups. Uh, but on the outreach and education side, um, I provide just a couple of things that we've done recently. We went to the Hanford Journey event uh, last Friday that was actually put on by uh, Yakima Nation and Columbia Riverkeeper, and we're very thankful for the invite and that we got to participate in that. Um, our uh, director of our agency, Laura Watson, was there and she made some remarks. Um, and I believe Columbia Riverkeeper live streamed that, so if anybody wants to see Laura's comments, you could, you could watch her speech. Uh, we, we also been continuing our virtual Let's Talk About Hanford series back in March, right after the HAB meeting, actually. Uh, from March, we did an event on LERF ETF and the 242A evaporator, which about that time of the year, there's actually a bunch of comment periods going on. So we thought it was timely to, to chat about um, those facilities and our agency's role uh, at that meeting. And then on June 7th, we held a compliance event where we talked about Ecology's compliance work at Hanford, you know, including inspections, enforcement actions, and other compliance kind of work that we do. Uh, we're continuing to plan future events for the Let's Talk About Hanford. And so stay tuned for our next one. We are still working on the planning. Uh, back in April, we also attended the Salmon Summit, which was put on by the Benton Conservation District. And um, it was part of the Salmon and the Classroom release. That was on April 26th and 27th. Uh, our team, uh, Ginger Wireman, along with others, shared information on Hanford Habitat and Wildlife to about 450 fourth and fifth grade students, as, as well as their teachers and chaperones. Also note that uh, as we continue to, you know, go back into person, we're planning more and more in-person outreach and education. We want to keep doing, you know, some of our virtual stuff. But we want to keep doing in-person as well, since we know there's some things in person that you just can't do digital. Uh, so we've been planning more of those. I believe uh, Ginger and I actually have an event on July 11th, but we're working to schedule more and get back into it. So if anybody wants an ecology presentation in person, feel free to reach out to us. And next slide, Ruth. So like Brian mentioned, the governor came and visited uh, Tri-Cities in Hanford on June 2nd. So um, so he came to discuss progress and budget needs in Hanford. He started the day with a roundtable event at the Ecology Office in Richland. 
Um, so at that round table, it consisted of uh, tribal representatives and labor, business, and nonprofit leaders to discuss the need for renewed investment. Uh, we had also invited the HAB chair and vice chair to that round table, but they were unfortunately able to make it. Um, we, we followed that with a kind of a media availability session at the ecology office where uh, Gov Ensley and Laura talked with the reporters at our office about advocacy and the need for compliant budget at Hanford. Um, and then, and then uh, the governor paid a visit and provided remarks at LIGO's grand opening of the new exploration center there. I'm not going to spell out the acronym since Brian did, and, and I can't ever remember that acronym. <laughs> um, and then, of course, uh, as Brian mentioned in the afternoon, the governor paid a visit to the Hanford site. He, uh, and we want to you know, share our sincere thanks to Brian and everybody at the U.S. Department of Energy for collaborating with us and coordinating Governor Inslee's stops at the Hanford site. That, um, you know, that tour kind of included stops at the cold test facility sample tank, which is offsite, and then at the low activity waste plant. And we saw the progress being made and the work that's um, being done on site. And I know the governor is pretty excited about getting you know, DF law up and going. And I uh, just want to mention, you know, on June 8th, the White House made an announcement or um, the White House amended its fiscal year 2023 Hanford budget request by an additional $191 million. Uh, this new request, which is roughly about $2.72 billion, would exceed what was appropriated by Congress last year, which was about $2.69 billion. And I'll just echo uh, Laura's comments that she shared back on June 8th, which is that, uh, you know, while this boost in the budget request for FY23 is excellent news, we still have a long way to go. If we're going to keep Hanford cleanup on track, we need to see significant boosts in funding in 2024 and beyond. And we're really thankful to Senator Patty Murray, Governor Jay Inslee, and all of the groups and communities involved in collaborating and advocating for adequate funding for cleanup at Hanford. And I'll go ahead and turn it back to Stephanie for the next slide. Thanks, Ryan. So continuing on with tri-party uh, negotiations, I know this has been a slide that's been in here for you know a while, but we did want to provide an update. So the tri-parties in the Department of Justice continue to meet to discuss tank waste matters described in ecology director's letter that went out in May of 2019. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that is actually where David is at, and I'm sure a number of folks from the Department of Energy uh, are there as well, and I'm sure they're um, making some good headway as part of those conversations. As just sort of a reminder, what is covered in holistic negotiations per that letter from Director uh, Bellin is pace and timing of tank retrieval and closure, pace and timing of tank waste treatment, and mitigation me measures and interim disposal of tank waste. Some other negotiations or milestone changes that we're talking about right now, uh, the tri-parties will hold public comment and public and hold a public meeting on 16 new milestones as part of the central plateau milestone changes that includes milestones to reinstate 14 suspended existing milestones. And then also our single shell tank waste management area C negotiations. We've been working with the Department of Energy since around 2017 to set those milestones. And we're optimistic that we can reach, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, tentative agreement and hold public comment on those as well. Continuing on to the next slide and compliance activities. So this is a summary of our compliance activities since the last time we provided an update here at the HAB. Um, for folks that don't know, we have a performance partnership agreement with the Environmental Protection Agency that requires we conduct a number of inspections within a certain fiscal year, uh, which drives the inspections that we do conduct. And those that we conducted for the last three months include the waste encapsulation storage facility was conducted in April, as well as the solid waste operations complex, which includes the central waste complex, Waste Receiving and Processing Facility, or RAP, NT plant. We did an inspection of 222S Lab on May 10th, the 325 building in June, as well as the 242A evaporator in June as well. The next slide highlights those uh, compliance reports that we've issued. So each compliance inspection we do, we're obligated to issue a report of any uh, findings or issues. The reports that we issued for the last three months include the groundwater operation and maintenance. That includes a number of various different units which are listed in that sub-bullet there. I won't read each one. Uh, we did a compliance report for the double shell tank system as well as the generator areas in May. We did B plant and Purex in June. And then the 400 area dangerous waste management units are which are within the or near the fast flux test facility that was also in June. Continuing to the next slide, 
opportunities for public comments on the permits. So one of the largest missions that we have at the Department of Ecology are uh, maintaining the current Hanford site-wide dangerous waste permit. And we do that by reviewing and issuing permit modifications to that permit. Here are some upcoming modifications that also have an opportunity for public comment. The first one, uh, Brian actually referred to the work. It's a class two permit modification for the waste encapsulation storage facility that is planned uh, to cover the increase in storage capacity for G cell. That's the cell that they will process the 19 uh, 36 cesium strontium capsules to get to dry storage. That's the public comment period is planned to start next month, July 6th through September 4th. We have a class three permit modification for the 400 area waste management unit. That was originally a class two permit modification to propose language to remove reference to the fast flux test facility fire alarm system that no longer provides alarms to the 400 area waste management unit. Uh, the permit modification when sent to us for public comment was deficient, so Ecology's reclassified that to a class three, and the dates are still to be determined for when that second portion or 45-day com comment period will be held. We do anticipate it will be uh, sometime this year. Another class three permit modification, we're proposing revisions to the integrated dis disposal facility operating language. This is a reopened class three permit modification that was originally transmitted back in 2021 or last year. We did approve a temporary authorization for work to move forward to construct the storage pad as part of that work. And that was approved on June 1st. The, uh, second, the second portion of that comment period will be July 25th through September 9th. And then lastly, we have a class three permit modification, another one for the integrated disposal facility associated with the legit collection system. That uh, first half of that permit modification ended back in July. We've completed our technical review and we anticipate that will go out this year for the second comment period. You can skip the next slide, Ruth, and just continue on to the Hanford site-wide permit update. Perfect, yes, that slide. Uh, so Ryan shared with me that uh, a few folks have been asking what the status is of the Hanford site-wide dangerous waste permit renewal. That is uh, <laughs> a mouthful. I know it's fondly called Rev 9 or Revision 9 of the Hanford site-wide dangerous waste permit. A little bit of history, that permit went out for public comment back in 2012. We received around 4,000 comments that we've been uh, reviewing and responding to. As part of responding to comments, you also review the application to see what changes need to be made to address those public comments or deficiencies. We went through an extended process with our sister program, the Hazardous Waste Toxic Reduction Program at Ecology, as well as EPA Region 10, their RICRA program, to review those comments and set up uh, a process to ensure consistency in application of regulations as part of that renewal review. Um, we have been going through workshops with the Department of Energy for about, you know, the last five years to ensure we're reviewing each of the agenda for each of the various 28 unit groups, which will go out as part of Rev9. Uh, originally, we were hoping to have the files locked down for Rev9 and that permit to go out for public comment again early next year. Since then, we have decided to push out the baseline to lock down 15 unit groups to May of next year. We've done that for a few reasons. It will allow us additional time to hire resources. As I shared earlier, uh, we are down quite a few resources right now, especially on the environmental specialist side. Those positions tend to be our permit writers and the folks that are the most hands-on in reviewing our permits. So they're critical in order to help us move forward with the Rev9 mission. Uh, it will also allow us time to implement our expedited issue resolution process, uh, and it also allowed, it, allowed us time to review the high priority permit modifications that were needed to support DF law. Um, you know, as Brian was giving his update on all of the fantastic work they've done, you know, a lot of it during COVID for the last two and a half years, our teams work really closely together on each of those permits that were needed, you know, especially for LURF ETF, everyone probably saw that there was just permit modification on top of permit modification to support all of their, the various operational changes that were needed to continue that work. And I think we were able to do that successfully and on time to support all of those schedules. 
So here's a list of the 15 unit groups through which the baseline we pushed out to May of next year it includes the 242A evaporator, the 222S laboratory, the non-radioactive dangerous waste landfill, fondly called Nerdwall, the double shell tanks, the single shell tanks, the liquid effluent retention facility, effluent treatment facility, low level burial grounds, trenches 31, 34, 94, the 216B63 trench, 216B3 pond, T plant, low level burial ground Green Islands, central waste complex, waste receiving and processing facility, 325 hazardous waste treatment units, and the hexone storage and treatment facility. The remainder of the units, so there's 13 that aren't listed there. We do anticipate those complete this month or when the, within the next few months. Um, EPA, and I'm not pointing to Dave Enan here sitting next to me again, I'm referring to when I talk about EPA Region 10, their RICRA program, uh, they have shared with us that they have a new strategic plan that lists that all of the dangerous waste permit renewals shall be complete by 2026. And when you look at overall the schedule, you know, I say lockdown of these files in May of 2023, uh, we're talking about a permit that will be 20,000 some pages. Uh, maybe even more than that. And so there will be an extended period of time that we'll need in order to prepare that permit for public comment. Um, so looking at what we did last time was 120 days public comment for review of the Rev9 permit. Um, and then also time for us to review any additional comments. It won't be far off uh, from 26 by the time we are able to get a permit issued. So it's important that we stick to May 23 to get the files locked down, not push out anymore. And that's our commitment that we've made to EPA. Continuing on down to the next slide. So what we're going to do in continuing to make Rev9 a priority, we're encouraging our staff to finish Rev9 as soon as possible. We're dedicating resources from Ecology, Department of Energy is doing the same and our contractors. Rev9 is, has been a standing topic at the Hanford Senior Executive Committee meetings uh, with Laura and Brian. And we've all talked about um, how important Rev9 is so ensuring that we have resources as best we can is definitely important. We're ensuring, Ecology is ensuring that we're preparing a complete and enforceable permit that addresses each of the comments and concerns that we've received. And then ensuring moving forward that there's a tri-party agency focus to prepare for the revised renewal. That includes management support and direction to staff that May 23 is a due date, it's not negotiable. And direction to staff to approach permit development and issue issue resolution with a solution-minded solution focus and a can-do attitude. So continuing on, uh, regarding Rev9, you know, I really did want to highlight all of the work that we have done so far. So each application is made up, each unit group will have 11 different addenda associated with it. Um, and when you look at each of those addenda, we have what's called a, a conceptual agreement package, which we use to review a permit to identify any deficiencies associated with it and to also respond to public comments. In order to ensure consistency in how we address deficiencies, we developed what we call a major theme process. And we develop uh, major themes in a collaborative manner with the Department of Energy. Um, those are deficiencies that impact more than 50% um, of the unit groups that have that various agenda. So oftentimes it is complex and it's challenging to come to an agreement on what will be included in the permit. Oftentimes if you have something that was built uh, pre-institution of RECRA. So we have made a ton of progress. Nine of 11 of the major themes are completed and that's actually 10 now. We just completed preparedness and prevention and we have one remaining and there's very few agreements left to be made. We have one unit group that only has one addenda remaining. That means that there's one addenda left before all the files are locked down and it's ready to go into Rev9. Seven unit groups have two addenda, four unit groups have three, three unit groups have four remaining, one unit group has five, three unit groups have six, and four have seven. Continuing on to the next slide. That really is just the acronyms legend. I tried to do my best to not use acronyms, but some always tend to slip by me. So here's a slide that covers those, hopefully all of the ones that I might've used. And then the last slide is really just for questions. And as Ruth said, I know you wanted to wait until all of the tri-parties present. So I'll turn it back to you, Ruth. Thank you. Um, we've got a, a queue that we're keeping for folks who have questions that want to ask. Um, I will at, check with the folks on the phone. We've got like six folks who are only on the phone. want to make sure that they get in queue if they need it as well. 
If you want to find a copy of the presentation, either from DOE or Ecology, they're posted on the Hanford website. Um, the link's in the chat. We can show you where that is. Um, and there are a limited number of copies of presentations available at the back table. So with that, Dave Enan, you with us? Yep. Good right. morning, everyone. Um, again, thank you for being here. Uh, this is, it, like I, folks have said, being in person is is amazing after two and a half years. Um, really thankful that we can, can be here. Uh, I've got just over half of my staff here. Um, sitting next to me is Roberto Armijo. Um, and in the back there, we've got Laura Bulo and Jeff Schramm. Um, the two folks not represented are Craig Cameron and Annie McCartney. But we're not doing any recruitment right now, but but we're, because we, we actually got some done. Um, so we're, I'm pretty happy about that. <clears throat> The newest, the, the, you know, I guess the new staff we've got is uh, we finally got a regional administrator, uh, Casey Sixkiller, started with us about eight weeks ago now. Um, he's, he's from the Northwest. Um, he's an enrolled member of the Cherokee Nation and only had to, uh, one briefing with him so far, and it's been pretty good. We're looking at efforts to get him out on site. Um, and, and Brian, just so you know, your team has been like, remember, we want to bring him out here as soon as he can. So we're, we're working that. Uh, and I appreciate the, the, that invitation. Um, in terms of, you know, what, you know, a lot of the things I was going to touch on were, were covered, but, you know, there's, you know, Brian hit a, hit a lot of kind of really high, a lot of bigger visibility projects that are going on, but there's still plenty of other work going on in the circle world. There's still cleanup at 100K. There's other cleanup going on in the 300 area. We're working on finishing up 100 BC. There's work at DNH. So there's, there is a lot of work other than those those kind of high visibility right there's just a lot of, still a lot of good work happening at Hanford um, and I don't want us to, to forget that um, you know, Stephanie mentioned the the central plateau milestone changes and the upcoming public comment period that starts the fifth so it starts next Tuesday um, and it'll run through August 19. Um, and really looking forward to, to getting the public comments on that and, and sharing what we're doing there. It's actually kind of, believe it or not, I'm actually kind of, negotiations and milestones are never a lot of, of fun, but I am kind of excited to see how this one, how this one works out. Um, and then also, as, as Stephanie mentioned, uh, uh, the, the REV-9 permit is in, in, in um, caught up or it's covered by the the EPA priority and the the to get the all permits done by 26 and uh, and I, I really appreciate the the fact that the the department is 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 working to make that happen um, I don't know if if folks would have uh, we do have a change in our our recre program in terms of Hanford um, the longtime Hanford expert for the, our, that program is retiring this week, um, and so we've got a new a new per, that's that's Dave Barris is retiring, um, and we've got a new person who is has been around the region a while but uh, hasn't had a, a lot of in depth Hanford experience yet. Her name is Michelle Mullen, and so she is is taking up that mantle and we're looking forward to it. Um, and with, with that, I think I'll, I'll stop there to, to save time for you all. Thank you. <clears throat> so I wanna check, we've got about six people on the phone. Is there anybody on the phone who also wants to be in the queue? 
All right, I've got about eight people in the queue, starting with Mike Karenko, going to Liz, um, and then Amber. So Mike, what's on your mind? Yeah, well, uh, this is sort of my last meeting after about a decade, but I, I thought I would leave one strategic suggestion that I, I, you can take or leave, but uh, when we're trying to uh, communicate to Congress progress and we talk about all this extra work that's being done that is getting no visibility, my suggestion is that the Department of Energy sent a 10-year objective to collapse the Hanford site boundary to the Central Plateau. <laughs> And uh, you can take credit as you move the fence to the boundary on a, just here's the progress and people can see boundaries moving. That's versus waiting for the vitrification plant to be finished, which will probably all clearly be dead by then. But uh, so you'd be able to communicate progress and uh, that there, and so you'd have to reach out to land use, which is a delicate territory working with the Native Americans and uh, Tridec just to start the process. And that's a long process, but it's high visibility and you could collect recognition for all the fine work that's been done that's usually in the noise. And, and so as you collapse the boundary to the central plateau, it has some challenges. Kind of challenges are going to be uh, the emergency evacuation system based on the the uh, safety analysis for the tanks and the pit plants. And, and so it's not without challenges, but uh, I think within five to 10 years, you can start seeing progress. It'll be a delicate, controversial uh, communication effort, but it, it'll be kind of fun. I personally would like to see a bike path all along the river uh, and, and that would really link to the Tri-Cities and help the whole community while you're trying to get the central plateau done. So that, that's my parting suggestion. Take it earlier, thank you. All right, I've got Liz, Amber, and then Richard. Liz? Thanks, Ruth, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thanks. Um, I had one question, and it's, I'm not sure if Brian's still there. One question for Brian, and then um, a comment. Um, I saw in, I think in May, the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board had a few comments um, in a letter about the um, quality assurance management process for TISCR. And I was wondering if you could talk about those issues, um, including they wrote about a less than adequate development and review of design changes. Honey, I cannot talk to you right now. <laughs> it was a unique public comment, I think. Sorry about that. Um, sorry. So the first thing is less than adequate development and review of design changes and a deficient supplier quality assurance program. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Liz. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just having a little trouble hearing you. Um, so the, the QA issues that um, were resident with, uh, I think you're talking about the waste treatment plant. We had about 13 or 14 issues that lasted over about a six to seven year period where we just couldn't converge with the contractor on the resolution of those issues. Um, we applied an approach that we used to develop jointly with the contractor, um, with Bechtel, the the safety analysis and, and basically created, I hate the term, a war room. Um, I'll call it a collaboration room um, and, and really brought the teams together and worked through each of the issues um, at a leadership level above where there had been entrenchment between the teams built over time. And within, I think, seven months, we were able to work through all of those issues with Bechtel um, have a path forward uh, in place, and we retired all of those issues um, together. Um, I think when we, think when we talk about design changes as well, um, we, we're very uh, judicious as we look at where the, you know, obviously in the DF law program, we're not entertaining design changes at this point, um, unless they're absolutely necessary to support the operation of the machine um, because of the 
you know, I call them recreational design changes, really don't um, add a, a design cycle to it and could end up rippling effects into the systems and you know, spend time, money, and delay the start of treatment. Um, and so we're, we're very judicious about those now. And the department and our contractor partners look at each of those, um, those issues individually, um, assess the pros and cons of each one, and then we really look to whether we can feather in future design changes at a time that's more logical when we won't impact um, either safety or operation of the systems and machine um, at a time that's more logical in the process. Um, we really are mindful of the, of the defense board. We have a great relationship with our defense board representatives here. Um, my team gets a brief either every week or every other week and I sit in when I can um, because they have good insights from across the complex on a number of issues and they, they actually are very helpful in identifying opportunities for improvement that we're always um, happy to hear. Um, but we, we have to be judicious about design changes as we look to the future and as, I'm assuming we'll get to a successful conclusion of the discussions with the state on the high level waste way ahead. We also have to be judicious about codes and standards applications. Um, that impact the designs that we already have placed because every design has can have implications for um, procurements and ripple downstream costs, et cetera. Um, and we really just have to make sure that they make sense. So I think our process is robust. We have um, gotten to the point where we can have more challenging conversations with our contractors um, easily, more easily. Um, and work together to create good outcomes um, than maybe the culture of the past supported. And I think that's playing itself out in many positive ways across the department and contractor and contractor to contractor relationships. I hope that answered your question. Thanks, um, and I apologize um, for the interruption from my daughter. Um, and I may have missed you saying this, but I, I know with quality assurance issues, if it's about um, vendor reliability. I'm just curious how you can, or at least my understanding of quality assurance issues is you can't, it, it's hard to inspect things that have already been installed. So I'm just curious if you could talk about how that, those kinds of issues are resolved um, with knowing that Tisker's already in it's been built, it's in process, and maybe it's replacement equipment. And maybe this is something that Tank Waste Committee can get a, a more thorough briefing on. But I was just curious how that specific issue is resolved, or maybe there's an example you could um, point to that specific. Yeah, there's there's always processes that we can apply commercial grade get dedication, where when we get systems and components that maybe did not have some of the pedigree uh, in the manufacturing process, the contractors um, and our team can go through a process to uh, validate effect effectively upgrade the quality assurance um, pedigree of specific pieces and parts. And we usually have a lot of great support from the vendors when we go through that commercial dedication process as well. So that, that's a fairly mature process. It's, it's well-defined and it could be something that if if you're interested in, we could bring it to the tank waste committee to talk about because it's going to happen um, fairly routinely for a while in a plant um, that was largely designed in the 90s and early 2000s that we're putting into operation in 2023. Thanks, that's helpful. Um, and just my my comment was just about um, public involvement. Um, I feel like we're we're in a maybe not necessarily seeing eye to eye on what um, quality and meaningful and robust public engagement looks like. And we've we've just been seeing a lot of um, and hearing a lot of statements that um, public involvement is going really well. And um, I think it would be great if we had um, a lot more regional public involvement efforts that are actually out in person, talking to people, um, meetings that are on general topics, not just the required public comment period, public meetings and engagement. 
And the Public Involvement Committee has for years now issued a lot of really helpful advice to do that kind of quality, meaningful engagement. And I hope that that will be revisited um, to that that disconnect can be um, addressed. Um, thanks. All right, I've got six people in queue. I've got Amber, Richard, and Chris Sutton next. Amber? Hello. I uh, don't know if I've had a chance to meet everybody here, but I'm on the board of Heart of America Northwest. And many moons ago, I was on this board uh, as a young organizer. Um, you know, I was a teenager back then, uh, practically. Uh, so I live up in Spokane, came down today for the meeting. It was great to see some friendly old, uh, not old, wise, <laughs> wiser faces. Um, I, hey, I've got a little gray hair myself. Um, but it was great to be back on, on the board, and I appreciated the updates. It's been hard to connect, you know, over Zoom. Uh, I think I've been on the board now back like a year and a half or so. And so anyway, I appreciate being able to see folks in person and meet new um uh, new regulators and uh, get to know folks. So hopefully I get a chance to get to know you over the course of today. Um, so I, I appreciated the updates and I just had, I guess for Mr. Vance, uh, you talked about the risk reduction activities and also public engagement. Um, so I kind of wanted to follow up on, I didn't know what Liz was going to talk about, but it was interesting because I was also going to follow up on public engagement, but on a specific topic. Uh, the slides really didn't touch on the B109 leaking tank, which was a big topic of, of conversation. Um, you know, over a year ago, we found out it was leaking. Sounds like it was leaking probably three years prior, you know, at least three years um, from the data. And so I guess what are the plans for conversation with this board about ways, you know, legally we need to stop that leak. We need to remove the waste. We need to do something to keep that waste contained. Um, what are the what are the plans to engage this board in you know what those conversations with the public would be? I guess following up on Liz's point, I mean this seems like the perfect opportunity to engage the public around alternatives to address a leaking tank that um, you know legally U.S. Dewey needs to to address. So I guess I'm wondering, Mr. Vance, like what are what are the plans to engage this board and the public around the region um, in the next, you know, as soon as possible around what to do with that tank? Well, we, we are working with the state um, on a, a path ahead. I think we're probably in the Stephanie Elnotter trigger head in relatively the final stages of the, some of those conversations at this point. Um, you know, it's it's always very simple to say leaking tank bad. Um, when you look at the Hanford site, though, um, there's nothing simple about the Hanford site. Um, the B109 issue we've we've discussed many many times in this board, and I think through some of the subcommittees as well. Um, we make decisions on the site based on the risk profile, and so in uh, when there's a limited funding available, um, we have a teak tank that leaking. I'll assume a thousand gallons per year into an area of the central plateau um, where during the life of the mission, 50 million gallons of tank waste was discharged directly to the soil. It's well below ground. Um, so there's no risk to the workforce, no risk to the public with an active mitigation in place with a groundwater program that's extracting 6 million gallons a month. So there's no groundwater leaving that area to move in any way towards the river. Um, it's, it's frankly not a risk that we believe is necessary to expend funds on when funds are limited. Um, so we'll, you know, as, as you look at those situations, again, where it's taken out of context, I mean, it's a simple issue. When you look at the complexity of the site, limited resources, the press to deliver tank waste treatment at a macro level, start the vitrification process, um, and some of the other much higher risks that we manage on the site, um, moving those towards uh, to mitigate or eliminate those risks, B109 doesn't doesn't crack the top 50, and so we'll continue to work with the state. 
to develop an approach that we agree with ecology on and, and ecology may have a public comment period associated with it. I don't know if that occurs or not, um, but that's how we'll continue to pursue it. Well, I guess I would like to encourage and ask that ecology, EPA and um, USDOE use this as an opportunity to engage the public in what are those alternatives to address leaking tanks. Uh, I, I hear what you're saying, but there are legal requirements and there, there is a, it's an opportunity to engage the public around what are those alternatives? Cause you know, this is one of many tanks and we need to have alternatives to, to address it. So thank you. All right, I've got Richard, Chris and Shelley next in queue, Richard. Uh, yes, I got two questions, two technical questions for Mr. Vance. Um, you're, you said the Tisker has processed three, 300,000 gallons. Approaching. Yeah, approaching. Okay. Uh, have, have you done uh, ion exchange change out yet? Sorry? Ion exchange change out? Yes. So how many ion exchange columns or have collected of 33,000? Yeah, we we, knew, we, we used uh, two ion exchange columns for the first campaign of 197,000 gallons. Okay. Those were removed and placed on the storage pad. Um, and and so, so far two. And um, we'll continue to execute that process as we go forward. So one ion exchange co column per 100,000 gallons? Well, there's, about? you know, there's three columns in series, two columns in a polishing column. And it just depends on the loading in each column as they go through the process. Well, my I would question, assess based 10, on the first 10 for the first million. Yeah. I, I, well, you know, Maybe. we did, we did 200,000 gallons of two columns. So okay. let's, let's say 10. Yeah. All right. That, that was my question. Yeah. Uh, the water treatment upgrade will uh, basically eliminate the chlorine gas in 200 areas. That's correct. Yeah. We'll, we'll use uh, more current technology and the chlorine gas risk will be removed from the site. And then I'll piggyback on her question of B109. We, we have you know, submitted advice uh, back uh, March 24th meeting. Uh, when do you think the negotiations on B109 in response to our advice? We're, we're still working We're still working with the state. When we've agreed with the state, then, then that will be officially part of the response to the I'll, I'll peek back to a question for ecology later, but one more, one more comment. Um, you know, I've worked out in Hanford for over 30 years. I worked within the DOE system for almost 40, uh, and six at Rocky Flats with, with Mike. Um, I can tell you, Hanford work is tough. It's hard. It's, it's, it's miserable. Of my 40 years of working, I think I've had three good ones where I enjoyed the job. And from that standpoint, and they were all working for Westinghouse, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, it was, you know, I've worked for five, six different contractors over the years. Um, Westinghouse was the only one that was worth a damn. The rest of them, eh, they come and go. Uh, I don't think Mike's laughing, but, but the truth of the matter is, uh, you know, as you try and recruit, and the same thing goes for ecology, as you try and recruit, think about the, the pleasure that an employee gets from working. And I'll piggyback into another thing. I'm still on the Ben Franklin Transit Board. We, we, luckily, we will have a new transit general manager coming on board next month. I am pushing really hard to provide scheduled Ben Franklin Transit service to Hanford on Hanford, but on, on Ben Franklin Transit buses with Ben Franklin Transit, not relying on DOE money. So it's no ham tech issues as far as the bus is rolling out there. But I do implore you to as your approach next month, when our new general manager comes on board, that your staff feels, understands that an hour commute out there and an hour commute back is a big detriment to getting people to work out there. And so 
welcome us with open arms, please. And that's my, I mean, for 12 years, I have been trying to get bus service out to Hanford. And it's been rejected. We are not responsible for how the employees get out there, but you're responsible to having employees. And that one piece will, one, one aspect of it that really will make a difference. So now I'll move over to ecology questions. Like I said, I've worked 40 years in the complex, over 20 of them as being what's equivalent to environmental compliance officer, or as I referred to myself as an environmental non-compliance officer, because the rules are, you know, I once told the president of Westinghouse Hanford, so it's not a question of non-compliance not happening. It's just how bad is it going to be? Because the rules are just, you know, a 20,000 page permit, impossible, just impossible. Just for your information, that's 10 boxes of reams of paper. I mean, that's two boxes of reams of paper. Think about that. You, you're never going to be able to review it. So I, I implore you to think about going on a diet. Uh, and I, I, I come back that the only successful permit that I've dealt with in all those years and use the model of the air permit, mm -hmm. the Brad air permit, by the way, where you have the application, the NOC, yeah, you have thousands and millions of pages of NOC, but you have the permit and it's only each unit is only a few pages and these are the rules. And that's what you aspect. But my question comes down to is you had a compliance review in May and June. What's the status of compliance? Yay, nay. Happy, sad, should we be concerned? So just to verify your question. So you're asking for each of the reports that we issued in May and June? Yeah. You know, I don't, I haven't read every specific report that we've issued. That's our compliance concerned? section. Uh, I need to take that back and talk to our compliance section. And I'm happy to do that. Well, I, I just, I mean, this is the public. Mm -hmm. So you should bring that to us. Should we have a concern with compliance? We, we you brought that we you had compliance reviews, but you know, Mr. Vance, are we concerned? Should we be concerned of your compliance? Okay, thank you. I'll make note of your question though and bring it back and provide you a response. All right, back to the the B109. I forgot to add on to that. B109 is a primary example of a mistake in permitting. You can't permit a leaking tank. You're true. It's a circle tank. It should be a circle tank. None of the single shell tanks are, could anywhere be considered record compliant. They are leaking. They are, if they aren't leaking, they will be leaking. The, it, nothing's compliant. It, it was a bad mistake that Mr. Uh, what Wigman agreed to back in the day, it's absurd. I mean, even the double shell tanks, I've worked double shell tanks for too many years. Even the double shell tanks, it's, it, it's compliance is just a bizarre. So from that standpoint, one big issue is to improve the 20,000 page permit is get some of them out of the permit and get them into circular because they are not active units. They're just things waiting to get cleaned up. Thank you. All right. The agenda says it's time for a break. I have four people who have questions and I know the time is limited for some of our senior TPA managers. So I'm gonna suggest we keep going with questions right now, knowing what the agenda says. Let me invite you to hug your microphone so people can hear you well. I've got Chris Sutton online and then Shelly, Bob, and Steve. Chris? Yes, this is a simple question. 
for ecology. Um, when would you envision the public, uh, the public meeting uh, on the 16 Central Plateau TPA milestones to be held? So I think Dave, you answered that, and I think you said July 5th through August. I don't remember what was 19th. Well, that was a public comment period, but I'm talking about the public meeting. In your slide, you said public meeting and public comments will happen. <laughs> Dave thinks it's August 9th. I'm not sure, but it looks like there's, oh, Dana's giving us a thumbs up from the back. So it's August 9th. Okay, thank you. There's a lot of power in Dana's thumbs up. We've got Shelly, Bob, and Steve. Shelly, thank you for waiting. Sure, I want Dana to weigh in on what I'm asking then. <laughs> I like that thumbs up thing. Um, if you can hug your mic so folks can hear you even, well. Even more than that. Yeah, thank okay. you. Um, I'm really curious, Stephanie, one of the things I think about for this board is the ability to track what's going on and you know how far down do we need to be in understanding the details to, to be part of uh, the discussions for the options for, uh, for taking a different path, if that, needs to, if that needs to happen. And so when I look at you know, the compliance activities, the inspections that happened in May and June and April of this year, um, where do we go to get that information? And, and on those inspections, thumbs up, just exactly what Richard said, thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, there, I've always felt like the permitting was the, what we should be focusing on um, because I think it's the best breadcrumb trail for understanding uh, the cleanup obligations and the risks. But when I look at what's going on with the compliance activities that just happened and our ability as a board to, uh, to get that information, to understand if there are defic deficiencies, to understand how do you score risk if, and how you calibrate deficiencies. Are they extreme enough that something needs to happen now, not you know, when we see it in 2023? Um, it's important to have that conversation, but it's also just as important to be open and to be transparent in this process. And so uh, do you have any thoughts on how to get this board and the public engaged in understanding, you know, when does something rise? You know, how does risk get scored when there's deficiencies that arise in these compliance activities? And um, does it matter uh, budgetarily also? So. You know, one thing that I was I was thinking about as uh, Richard was asking his question is, you know, maybe we need to provide more information as part of our slides. Um, if there is a specific concern that we have for, for a specific unit as we do our compliance reports. And I think, you know, we're happy to sort of give a summary and present that to the board. Um, you know, the one thing I'll say is that with our compliance inspections, you know, we'll issue a report and we may have findings and Department of Energy may not agree with those findings. And so then we go back and forth about, um, you know, how the, the finding or, or non-compliance will be resolved. Um, but, you know, we're happy to include additional information uh, to talk about the board, to talk about, we could even add to, um, you know, one of the subcommittees discussion as well regarding compliance. Um, I will say we don't tend to evaluate things by using the lens of risk so much in our compliance reports. The gauge is really uh, what the regulatory requirement is, and that's what's cited, cited in a finding. Um, but, you know, again, I'm happy to expand uh, and talk to David and work with Ryan on expanding the information that we share. I can say that each of our compliance reports that we issue, they are available to the public, and if uh, there's a specific, you know, forum or tool we can use to get you access to those. Um, we're happy to do that. I do believe they are posted in the uh, TPA AR. Part of the problem too, Stephanie, is just knowing that they're there and how to and how to find them. And that's not easy for the public. You know, it's not. So it's something to think about. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
Would it help if we put it put like a link in the presentation to the report? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. All right. I've got Bob and then Steve, and I promise you'll get a break. Bob? Only if I'm quiet. Uh, first off, <laughs> it's kind of fun to see the board push back. I've listened in on a number of these board meetings, and I'm I always enjoy when tough questions get asked, especially of the three folks who are tasked with answering them. So first I learned that everything is just great, 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 great. Aren't we a great team? Okay. Then I think about what I believe I know, and I look at the struggles each independent organization has and their own constituents. First off, I want to compliment everybody for taking their time to come here. I think everybody comes here with the the kind of a can do i want to make progress perspective and that's a very challenging environment to work within given our subject matter and so looking from ten thousand feet down i've been waiting for the last three years for the holistic negotiations to make real differences what does that even mean well as mike says if we ever get that bit plant up and running if I like to think it's going to happen. I'm optimistic, I guess. But that doesn't cure our waste problem, now does it? The board can address this if I could. There's a series of kind of running thoughts I have. What percentage of high level nuclear waste is actually going to be utilized and cleaned up by the bit plant? It isn't over 50%, I'll tell you that. Okay, so what's the remainder of the plant? When it gets put into a log, where's it going? Well, I don't think Yucca Mountain's open. Uh, some of the other, you know, that transuranic stuff that we used to ship to whip, eh, we're starting to get it off the ground again, I suppose, depending on where you're at. And when I, when I throw those things out, it is frustrating from a person who lives in the Tri-Cities for second. Mr. Vance, you and I have had this conversation, you know, the weebies, that means that we are the ones that suffer the risk. All the good intentions of everybody in the room. But when people, I mean, first off, the tri-party agreement really isn't Yalta, okay? I mean, it's important stuff, but it isn't the end of World War II and dividing the world up. And I look at ecology, I look at Department of Energy and the State Department of Ecology. And I wonder if we got the same goals. Three years to negotiate things in regards to, well, assuming we get that VIT plan up and running, we still got a big problem. What are we really going to do about it? When we evaluate risk, getting back to the 109 thing, you know, I, you got to be able to look at a risk profile, what's going to hurt the environment and the citizens that are around it, and not use that as a red herring to run away from the bigger questions. And that's what I see. I've been doing this for 25 years. There are tough questions. And I got to tell you, nobody wants to take the time to look at that train running down the track. It's kind of like three crows sitting on a railroad track, picking at a carcass. And they're not even looking up to see the train is gonna kill them all. And that's a hell of a place to be if you're a citizen. So why do I feel that way? Well, because it's a real fear. And so I, the holistic stuff, you know, we talk about public involvement and this is a, a good effort. And again, I applaud the group for pushing a little bit. But I guess what's not happening, at least from a public perspective, is negotiations that are very difficult because none of one of the parties wants to cede any authority or power to another. And the only people who are at risk are the people that live in the Tri-Cities. And I don't get a very good answer when I ask those kind of tough questions. You know, negotiating for the sake of negotiating is kind of pointless, especially if you're on the receiving end of that train coming down the track. So those are comments, but I've been listening to the holistic negotiations. I'm sure it involves grout. What are the alternative means of taking care of stuff that are in tanks? What's the long-term plan for the waste that isn't going to be vitrified? Boy, those are hard, aren't they? You know, I was looking at the work plan for next year. I don't see any of those on there. So, you know, 
every everybody's time here is very very valuable i think and i think everybody wants to contribute to make a difference and i'm not convinced we can if we don't have the same goals you know we talked about risk doe rolls up a new risk analysis plan we're gonna we're gonna do about every five years isn't that right mr vance we've got a brand new we're gonna we're gonna do cleanup based on risk hell nobody can even agree what that even means is it from the contractor's risk doe's liability expense or the citizens problems and, and so that's a frustration and so you know my job is to represent Richland, and I think Mr. Bloom might agree with me, and maybe Dave on part. You might. But everybody wants to do the right thing. But God, shed us a little light, give us a little hope that the short term things that we worry about, like 109, isn't a red herring, because it's easier to actually talk about 109 than look at the long term problem, because we don't have a solution. Money's part of it. Don't think it's not. Congressional clout makes a big difference. And those are things that I think we all need to analyze. And sometimes I think we, well, first off, nobody likes to do things that are really, really hard and complicated because our team might not want to play. So those are comments. I would like to know what the long-term plan is for not the vitrified waste, Mike, it's still going to happen, but the rest of the waste. What's the current plan from an apartment at Washington State Department of Ecology perspective, Department of Energy and Department of Ecology perspective? I'd like to hear what the plan is. Like that, didn't you? Go ahead. So <laughs> which one of you wants to jump in first? I think I always jump first. <laughs> well, I, I, I appreciate the comment, Bob, and, and, I, and I appreciate the passion and the intent I live here too. Um, so, you know, as, as I, I think part of what's got to play out, and I hate now that you've set me up, it's hard to say it, most of negotiations have to close out, um, which, which will help us determine um, a path ahead that the department um, working with the, the state deems affordable and achievable. Um, the, the sessions are mediated by a federal mediator, so they're under the, the, the cone a bit, but, but I think there is good, there is progress being made. And um, I think we, we do have a thought on a plan on a way ahead. Our first objective, as you recognize, is to deliver the waste treatment plant, start vitrifying waste. Um, and we're on a solid path for that. At that point, we're treating waste and, and we can start have broad, maybe broaden the conversation about the opportunities and options that are available to accelerate the overall mission. When I think about risk, I think about people first, the workforce and the community. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, we are cleaning up the environment. It is getting cleaner. It will continue to get cleaner, but we need to take care of the people on the, on the path. Um, there is that longer term challenge that we all face. Um, as we talked about, you know, there's not an unlimited source of money. And so we're making the best decisions we can um, from a risk perspective, from a technology perspective, from a affordability perspective to progress the mission. And well, it probably looks easy what we're doing to deliver the waste treatment plant. Um, not so easy, big lift. Um, the entire team is focused on, on getting to that point. Um, but once we start treating waste and we're learning from that process, and we, we have a way ahead on the high level waste mission, which I think we'll achieve in the not too distant future. The path will be a little bit clearer and we'll be able to talk about that more. Um, we certainly are still pursuing test bed initiative. Uh, we expect to get the WEIR, the technical evaluation re report from the NRC um, in July, which will put us on a path for another permit application to the state um, later this year. Um, and we see opportunities for dual path, parallel path opportunities on the low activity waste side as we progress the high level waste mission as well. So there's a lot in play. Um, I think I see a way ahead, but hosted negotiations have to conclude to make sure that we have a, a way ahead that the state supports as well. Um, and we are committed to execute the tank waste mission and we'll stay committed to it. You know, Mike, 
you know, I, I certainly signed on to get the waste treatment plant up and operating and we're, we're getting very close. And I think that's the first step in a longer path, but it's an important step demonstrating that the department can deliver the technology, can treat tank waste, can disposition tank waste um, in a way that's um, certainly in, appropriate. And I think the longer path is there. It's just the first hurdle, you know, is, is a high one and we're working to make sure we get to that one. And I think the other discussions we have going on are gonna create the, the right, the, um, a clear path for the rest of the site in the not too distant future. Stephanie and Dave. I don't have much additional to add other than what Brian shared, but we have been talking to Department of Energy about the test bed initiative, uh, like he referenced. And uh, it's my understanding that yes, in the next couple of months, we'll be sitting down talking about that research development demonstration permit again. Um, happen. Dave? Yeah. Again, I don't, EPA doesn't have a, a, a huge role in the, the tank waste treatment program, um, but we definitely, you know, as kind of a, a, a closer observer, I think the focus on getting DF law, getting that first treatment done is actually a good thing and it's important because that then proves to everybody that it really can be, can be done. You know, I don't know if you know this, Bob, but I'm, I've been here my whole life, third generation working at Hanford. So I plan to stay in the Tri-Cities. So, so Hanford cleanup is important to me and getting it, you know, making a reasonable decision, not a perfect decision. So I think getting again showing that we can do it you know we've all seen the fits and starts and the on the vit, vitrification over the years um it's getting it going is the first step but then of course it's going to be so what have you done for me today <laughs> right i mean that's gonna the department has to know that that's going to be the next it's like okay now you've proven this what's next we got to work on the next piece so I think you're, you're right to bring that focus up of what, because we also know that the vitrification is only part of the solution we need. And we, we, we have to focus on the whole program. All right, Steve, you get the last word before break. Wow. What a great meeting. This discussion really reminds me of why the HAB's future is so important. And the honesty of the conversation tells me we need to keep the kimono open. We did some things along the way. By the way, my first day on site, I rode this old blue bus out to the site freezing my little California cheeks off because it was winter and I didn't know what winter was coming from California and those buses weren't very well heated. But I would say that one of my mentors when I first got out there was one of the startup engineers for B Reactor. So let's date ourselves a little bit. And as what my job was, was to help Rockwell begin to get into compliance with the newly applied regulatory requirements based on the fact that DOE lost all these lawsuits. I would comment that when we salt well pumped those tanks, we knew we weren't getting all the liquid out and we knew they would leak and we knew you could never make them RECRA compliant. And that is not an opinion, that is a fact. Um, so sorry we did that, but we did that. Now you get to deal with it. Um, but I'm very pleased to see that the agencies are really seriously rubbing their foreheads together to try to ferret out a path forward through this thing that we all created and that we all need cleaned up because 
when my grandson becomes a mayor of Richland, I don't want him to have to deal with some of the issues that we created. Um, and I do want that bike path to be reactor during the time that I could still ride a bike. So I appreciate what you guys are doing. <laughs> it's tough, it's really tough. And Richard's comments about the permit, hey, you know, I wrote some of the first record permits in California and they were just a few pages long, but they resulted in effective regulation. What we're doing is really strange. We got to clean up our act or our act will clean us up. So you folks that are on the future of the HAB, stay with it because it's important. And you folks that are working with the agencies and particularly DOE who has to pull this thing through the knot hole or th it's not through the you know, keyhole, whatever. <laughs> anyway, I, I just, I really think that this conversation today is gonna set the stage for some more honest conversation. We can't pretend that we are gonna be in compliant with every rule that was never written for this place. Almost none of these rules were written for this place, but we still have to get through a process to get the job done for future generations. And so stay with it. That's all I can say. All right, it's time for a break. You can put your cards down if you don't have any more questions. Um, we're gonna mute all the microphones. So your co informal conversations aren't necessarily shared with the world. And let's come back at 1120, please. the Hanford Advisory Board, your passion and commitment have made an impact. We trust future members of the HAB will work to build upon your legacy of service, constructively collaborating to contribute to the development of consensus advice and advancing awareness and understanding of Hanford's important cleanup mission for years to come. And I thank you all. EPA, do you have some comments? Yeah, again, good morning, members of the Hanford Advisory Board. And I wanna, it, I'm very much honored on the, the, the part of the EPA to recognize the, the Im immense contributions that you have provided to the board over the years and to Hanford cleanup. Your contributions derive from your sacrifices of day-to-day -day responsibilities, time and attention and have provided the, the it's, it's, it's a betterment to the cleanup of Hanford and for our impacted communities. I would like to personally thank you for all the times we've shared together. Um, and, you know, we've been through thick and thin and the, the pandemic and sudden changes. I, mean, I, I speak for myself, I speak for EPA, when I say that your service and knowledge has been invaluable. Um, your ranged and diverse experiences are what contribute to and co constitutes an effective advisory board. And that serves our communities locally and, and distant. As your formal role with the board comes to close, I ask you to please continue when you can to offer your insights, in, either be it in future public meetings or comment periods and to help mentor the, the new generation of, to the board. Um, I'm sure that they, just like EPA has in the past, will appreciate the guidance you can provide, your wisdom. I just, I wish you all the very best in, 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 in what, what's coming next and, and ask that you continue to contribute whatever way you can to, to sharing your wisdom and, and bettering Hanford Cleaner. Thank you. We have Emmy Leho with us um, remotely from DC. She has been working with the board for a number of years um, with EPA. Emmy, I was told you have something you wanna add, but we've gotta get you off mute. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. 
Uh, hi, everyone. I'm so sorry I can't be there to see all the faces of those of you in the room. Um, when I first started with EPA in 2009, it's been a minute now, I really started off working with the HAB um, under the mentoring of Dennis Falk, and it was one of the most rewarding aspects of my job while um, working out at our Hanford office for EPA. And I think of you all often. I hear a lot more on the chatter about the SSAB boards on the headquarters front and how the HAB is not like the others and uh, what makes it unique about our how active our stakeholders are when it comes to cleanup at Hanford. And that is in large part because of many of the people sitting around this table today and who have been sitting at the table for years. So thank you so much for all the work you've put in, all the input you've provided, the pushing the cleanup agencies and the regulators to make sure we're doing the best we can. I think at the end of the day, it has helped us get a better cleanup at Hanford. And I just wanna say thank you so much. Thank you, Emmy. Ecology? Thanks, Ruth. I'll start out and then I know Ryan wants to say a few words too. Um, so at Ecology, we put together uh, a, a thank you and about 20 of our folks at the Nuclear Waste Program signed that for all the outgoing uh, HAB members. So I think Ryan's going to provide a copy of that to everyone so you can have it. Um, I thought I would take the opportunity to read my comment and then also David Bowen's comment who couldn't be here today. So starting out with mine, I have had the wonderful opportunity to work with the Hanford Advisory Board as well as the subcommittees. The dedication you have shown, the support you have given, and the time you have spent championing the Hanford cleanup mission are invaluable. You have asked us hard questions, and we spent many hours working through issues to find the best path forward for the cleanup. I have truly enjoyed the time I spent working with you, learning from you, and getting to know you. Wishing you all the best in the future and hope to see you or hear from you soon. And then David's, thank you for the dedication over the years as an essential voice helping us understand the community's priorities and motivating our team to consider benefits of various concepts and proposal. Your participation in this unique format facilitated recurring interactions between the public, stakeholders, and agencies responsible for the Hanford cleanup, with the end result being development of well-informed decisions. Our sincere appreciation for your willingness to serve on the Hanford Advisory Board. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to share, as Stephanie shared, that we have a little departing gift in the remarks that I'm handing out. So if you haven't gotten one yet, don't worry. I'm tracking everybody down, and I'm also going to be mailing them out too. So I'll, I'll try and track the rest of you down throughout the day. And I'll just echo what Stephanie said. Thank you all very much for your service. And, and I've only been with Ecology about three and a half years now, but I, I greatly appreciate getting to know each and every one of you and the hard work that you... Oh, sorry, I keep pressing mute. <laughs> And we thought we were going to go away from the mute button when we went back to in-person. All right. Um, I want to take a pause here. Um, we're at the public comment time. So I will check back with recognition when we finish public comment. Um, I have two people signed up for pub public comment, Dan Seres and Susan Leckband. Is there anyone else who also wishes to share public comment at this time? I want to make sure. Okay, um, I will. I will point to you. I promise. Um, Susan. Dave's. Okay, we're live. <laughs> um, after more than twenty-five volunteer years dedicated to a better, safer, and cost-effective Hanford cleanup as a member of the Hanford Advisory Board, I submitted my resignation effective June 30th, which is tomorrow, 2022. I was privileged to serve as chair or vice chair for 18 of those years. As difficult as it is for me to leave the HAB, I just don't have the heart to participate in dismantling the incredibly successful, unique processes developed by HAB members to ensure fair, transparent, and inclusive discussions. Through education and discussion, HAB members brought diverse opinions together to develop and issue by consensus, which is almost a miracle and certainly a model 
for other people to look at. Issue by consensus, more than 300 letters of well-informed advice, recommendations, and white papers issued to the U.S. Department of Energy, the Washington State Department of Ecology, and the U.S. Environmental Agency. Each of those documents was reflective of HAB member and public values. It has become impossible for me to reconcile the DOE tenant of operating with noble intent with the fact that within the next 12 months, I estimate 90% of the HAB's institutional knowledge will have been lost as valued board members are removed from the HAB via implementation of term limits and waivers eliminated all under the guise of diversity. I applaud and welcome new members and urge you to take some time to read past advice. Some of it is really extraordinary and it's available electronically to the public. It will help you as you navigate the Hanford world. Ask all kinds of questions. Always remember your voice matters. I'm honored to have worked with so many wonderful, dedicated have members and I'm gonna cry because I think of them as family and tri-party agency staff over the years and count many of them as dear friends. I will remain hopeful for the best possible Hanford cleanup that protects the citizens of the Pacific Northwest, the Columbia River and the environment for future generations. Thank you for the privilege of serving. Thank you, Susan. Dan Seres, I believe you're online. Let's get you off a of mute and hear what you have to say. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, uh, I'm Dan Sears. I am the Conservation Director for Columbia Riverkeeper. I'm also a former board member for quite a few years. And while I'm not on the HAB anymore, I wanna say that I really remain appreciative of the work that HAB members, including many who are leaving or being uh, moved off the board um, the work you've done to continue to surface the issues and broaden understanding uh, related to Hanford cleanup. I deeply, deeply valued the time and opportunity to work with you on the HAB, and I learned an immense amount uh, from all of you. Um, I want to say thank you specifically to the outgoing board members who remained present, bringing up difficult issues, pouring over documents, educating yourselves, educating the public. Um, it makes a difference to all the communities impacted by Hanford to have people facilitating discussion um, and leading an effort to give policy level advice when it comes to the most complicated cleanup uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, on behalf of our members, I also want to specifically thank uh, Shelly Simone. Uh, Shelly agreed to take on our seat on the board several years ago, and since then Shelly has continued to offer incredible knowledge uh, perspective informed by decades of experience and a whole lot of uh, often unacknowledged hard work to the HAB and to the larger community who are relying on a successful Hanford cleanup. Uh, the context that Shelley provided to the HAB and to me personally about the history and the impact of Hanford's pollution and the effort to bring forward an understanding of the problems was just invaluable. Um, it's helped to educate a whole uh, broad range of younger folks who are trying to inherit some of the knowledge uh, here. And I'm quite confident that Shelley and the others here will likely forget more than I will ever know about the production era, the cleanup effort, um, the ongoing cleanup effort, and their effort to daylight the contamination problems at Hanford at that inflection point uh, between production and cleanup was really a critical phase. Um, and the more I've learned about that effort, the more I've been impressed by what was accomplished before I even became involved. Um, on a personal level, I learned a tremendous amount from Shelley uh, and from other departing members of the HAB. Uh, I was thinking about driving around a bus tour and Shelley pointing out one facility after another, the contamination problems in each, uh, the groundwater issues associated with each. Um, it was a profound learning experience, uh, but on a more kind of personal level, I would say that Shelley really taught me to see or helped me to see the Columbia River in a different way at Hanford, to see the Hanford reach for the tremendous natural beauty uh, 
it has and the potential for clean water, the potential for a cleanup that will restore the river and the land to the people who live there for time immemorial. Uh, Shelley once described to me, or actually in a video, that being at the White Bluffs was like being cradled in the arms of time. And years later, I really began to understand that more fully, the truth of what Shelley was saying and the timeless beauty of uh, Hanford uh, and the importance of the work that is happening here and throughout the region. Um, I just end by saying, keep this poison from the river forever is the task. And I've seen Shelley put a lot of effort into that work and I appreciate it deeply. Thank you, Shelley Simone. Thank you, Dan. Gosh. We had a gentleman in the back who wished to make public comment. If you'd come up to the microphone and let us know your name and share your thoughts with us. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is, can you hear me all right? My name is Kevin Burdett. Um, I'm a Seattle University law student. I'm interning with Heart of America Northwest. Um, I have some family here in the Tri-Cities along with Yakima um, and other parts of Eastern Washington. So specifically regarding the B109 uh, leakage, uh, the other comments appreciated, especially the, the interest in that. Um, so question for ecology. Um, you previously set deadlines for when these negotiations would be completed. Um, last year in July, you said you would give a few weeks for an agreement um, on the response for that leak. And then a few months later in August, 2021, you said you would give about two months um, for uh, you know, some sort of agreement to be made or some sort of order um, to be had under ecology's authority. So it's been about a year since then. Um, and in October, 2021, um, Director of Ecology, Laura Watson said, if ecology is unable to reach an agreement, we have the regulatory authority to issue an order that specifies the actions energy must take to stop the tank leak and schedule on which those actions must happen. So um, just interested to know if you have a deadline for the agreements where you won't hold off any longer um, on ordering a response, a response to an active leaking unpermittable tank um, with a schedule that responds in time to keep contaminants out of the ground groundwater, which would flow into the Columbia. Um, otherwise, is there a hard deadline that sets when this negotiation must be completed? Um, and then as well for the EPA, um, otherwise, uh, does the EPA have a plan to intervene in order to make sure this leak is addressed now that it has been over two years since the formal notice of a leak that showed signs of leaking three years uh, ago. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I owe you an apology for not clarifying how we handle public comment. So that's on me. Um, we welcome public comment. Um, the awkward part is that we're not actually able to answer questions that come up at public comment. So. And I, I, I owed you that explanation. I didn't give it to you. So I'm going to invite EPA and Ecology to connect with you um, sometime during this meeting to have that discussion since we can't do it at this moment. Okay. Uh, I guess I would have a question too. Is there a public opportunity to have those questions relayed or is that, if, if that makes sense? Well, they, they end up in the minutes for this meeting. Okay. Um, and and then however the agencies want to work with you, um, they can also come up at future committee meetings um, and the public is most welcome at committee meetings and is a part of those discussions as well. Okay, thank you. All right, Rose Ferry, you are online and you are also on the list for public comment. Are you with us? I am. There you are. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments with regards to um, the outgrow, outgoing board members. And um, <clears throat> while I wasn't part of the HAB directly, I have worked indirectly, um, especially with when Jean Bonnie was was part of the the HAB's board, and of course um, providing support to Lorraine Contreras, Contreras and Dana Miller. Um, I will be 
coming on board of the paperwork in uh, as an alternate. So I will be more active in the HABs. I, I managed in the my 12 years of service uh, to have missed that. And so now I they tag I'm it. I'm, I'm going to be coming on and being more involved. But um, and so I, I will look forward to working with folks um, in the future and, and be participating in, in uh, some of the committee meetings and, and whatnot moving forward and being a part of all of that. But what I really wanted to say is just definitely thank you to all of the board members who are leaving their service has been invaluable to this board. And uh, I guess say, even though I wasn't directly involved in the board, I have worked indirectly with some of these folks um, in other arenas, I'll say, uh, and, and certainly in, and through meetings and, and whatnot. And the institutional knowledge that they have is just absolutely irreplaceable. Um, I've stated in other meetings, I'll state it again. I wish that there could be a, a compromise made where there would be, instead of everybody leaving at once, it would be nice if they could retain a portion of the um, uh, existing members who have that, that all of that institutional knowledge and kind of do a gradual exiting, if you will, of some of these board members. I personally would love the opportunity to learn more from these folks. They, they, they say they, that the knowledge that they have is just invaluable. And I, I think it's a, a shame and a tragedy uh, for DOE to um, be having all of these folks exit all at the same time. And I still put it to DOE, not as a question or anything, just kind of as a comment that if if there's a way that they're that they are able to do more of a gradual exit over the course of say three to four years, I think the board and and the community and Hanford in general would benefit in retaining at least some of these folks and do more of a gradual um, exit. Um, anyway, that those are my comments. I will look forward to working with folks, and uh, I I hope DOE will think about the the opportunity to be able to maybe do that. It is within their discretion to do so. And I think that it would add value to the group if they would consider that. Thank you. Put yourself off mute, Ruth. Are there any others who wish to make public comment right now? There's also an opportunity for public comment tomorrow. So if you change your mind, there will be that opportunity. With that, we have one more thing to do before lunch. One of the, the awkward things about this year is we have a gap um, in HAB leadership because of the way appointments are made. As you've heard, many, of fo many folks are actually rotating off the board at the end of this month, meaning tomorrow. That leaves us with a gap between today and the fall when the new membership package and the new appointments are made. As it turns out, both your chair and your vice chair, Steve Wigman and Shelly Simone, are both rotating off of the board at midnight tomorrow. So in discussions with the TPA agencies and the practicalities of being headless isn't a great idea. Um, We've got permission to have an election for an interim chair and vice chair to get us through the summer, through the fall winter period until the board is fully reappointed and can then select members, or select its leadership going forward. So what we're looking at is electing an interim chair and vice chair for the next few months to get us through this awkward time. We have two nominations. For interim chair, we have Jan Cottrell. She's the representative from the League of Women Voters. And for vice chair, we have Susan Coleman. She's one of our public at large members who resides here in the Tri-Cities. The way this is gonna work is I'm gonna ask, are there any other nominations? <clears throat> You can't voluntold somebody. If you nominate them, we will make sure that they are willing to serve. And then voting is going to happen via two paths and you get to choose which one you wanna use. Because this is a hybrid meeting, I can't pass out little slips of paper and have all you vote that way, 
right? So you can vote by sending an email to our HAB email account, which Lacey's gonna put in the chat. It's hab at slind.net. It's gonna go in the chat for our online people. If you are in the room, you can send an email if you want. If you don't, Josh in the back has slips of paper that you can vote the old fashioned way. What you're gonna do is you're gonna give us your name, your seat, because elections and consensus on this board are done by seat. So name, seat, and your preference. What that means is if both the primary and the alternate are here for a seat, you only get one vote. So that's why I want your name and your seat so we don't double count anything. For those of you worried about quorum, I'm not worried about quorum because if we're collecting votes on paper and on email, enough of you will vote to hit the quorum number of 19 because I know how many of you are in the room and I know how many of you are online and we do in fact have a quorum. So the voting will happen over lunch and into the early afternoon. So you have time to do it. We're not gonna do it all in the next 30 seconds. Questions on the process? Okay. If you have questions, Lacey, Ta Lacey, Josh, and I are here. We'll answer any question you got. So at this time, let's go to interim chair. We have one nomination for interim chair, who's Jan Cottrell. Are there any other nominations for interim HAB chair? Anyone? All right, so we have one candidate for interim HAB chair. Jan, do you wish to say anything before we move to vice chair? Welcome to the in-person meeting for the first time in so long. I understand how upsetting it is for everything to be changing so substantially so fast but we have an opportunity here in the next few months to kind of reconstitute the Hanford Advisory Board so that we can do effective work going forward. It would be my honor to do this in, um, in this way. And of course, how can we say anything except that we stand on the shoulders of giants who have gone before us? So I... I look for your votes, thank you. The second open position is interim vice chair. We currently have a nomination of Susan Coleman for that position. Are there other nominations for interim vice chair? Anyone? So it appears we have a single nomination. Susan, would you like to say anything? Susan's fine. When she has something to say, she will say it. All right, so we have the two nominations. Choose your voting method. You can either send an email or you can get a piece of paper from Josh or Lacey. We want your name, your seat, and your preference and we will give you the results early afternoon after lunch. So you have time for that logistic to happen. Any questions? Got one thing I gotta do. So people know how to spell names. Okay. No questions. Oh, Tom Galeotto, do you have your hand up? 
yes, I was hoping to make some comments on the, our departing membership. It seems like we've passed that by now. Uh, well, we're, we're, we've actually wrapped up the morning business and we're 10 minutes early. So why don't you go ahead? Okay, well, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Um, as a number of people have said already, this is a a pretty momentous time period and a pretty momentous event that we that we are going through right now. Um, over the years, uh, there there's a some bits of wisdom that I've gathered, and one of them that I always come back to is uh, the one saying. We don't meet people by accident. Everyone is meant to cross our path for a reason. And I'm honored to have had the opportunity to cross paths with everyone associated with the HAB, and particularly with our HAB members that are departing us uh, here in the next few days. Many, many of the, these folks, and I, as I understand, there are 24 or 25 of these folks that are leaving the board. Um, were in leadership positions and were among the most active members of the HAB uh, throughout the years of, uh, of, of their presence on the HAB. We as an organization, and certainly I personally, will sorely miss working with these folks and benefiting from their energy and their experience. I really hope that we'll be able to continue our relationship with each of them as friends and colleagues outside of the HAB activities and I offer my very best wishes to each of them going forward. You'll, you'll be a great loss to our to our activities. Thank you for your service. And that's it, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Jerry, I see your card up. Thank you. I thought we might end up missing an opportunity to say something as departing board members here. Um, and those of you who know me for 20 plus years know that I would not miss an opportunity to say something. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, I will not disappear. Heart of America Northwest will be very, very well represented with uh, former uh, Spokane Council Member Amber Waldruff and, uh, and Alfonso Contreras in the seat for us. Um, but uh, at, I, am, I was deeply involved in the team that created the model for this board in the negotiations that went on for a couple of years. And we've forgotten the history. And in forgetting history, we have forgotten what the goals were and we've lost track of the benefits of being open to input as agency decision makers and knowing that you get better decisions when you listen to diverse viewpoints. In order to listen to diverse viewpoints, you have to allow for the viewpoints to choose who represents them. And that was the model of this board and going back to you know, the energy department was not a willing participant in the original um, uh, White House directed effort to have uh, the cleanup of DOD and DOE sites participate with the Keystone Center from Colorado in an effort to say, how can we address the contaminated legacy at military and nuclear weapons sites across this nation. And um, we had extraordinary leadership from a naval captain who is the son of the former governor of Oregon in visioning how you could build community support for cleanup that would be long lasting and um, by inviting disparate views to sit at the table by having people work together in seeking consensus. You built a regional effort for the cleanup of Hanford 
that was a model for the nation, has been written about over and over again as a model for public involvement and engagement, all of which is being thrown out by a military command structure like the desire to have only advice that the agencies um, ask for. If you only ask for advice on things that you want advice on, you obviously miss the big picture of the things that are causing problems, whether it's from the workforce and health and safety, or it's from the public and leaking high level waste tanks. Let's look at health and safety. If it wasn't for this board, the Department of Energy at Hanford would still be out there allowing workers to go into buildings with beryllium contamination at uh, levels that were acceptable then and are now uh, lowered to a hundredfold lower. Think about that in terms of lives saved. If it wasn't for the board, it wasn't the energy department nor the regulators that said, let's clean up alongside the Columbia River and push inland. It was the board and the public that said that and the board that worked it through, especially I want to re give recognition to the state of Oregon for um, promoting that, but it had to happen through the board and public engagement and the board's advice and the board working on the details of the public's desire to have a strategy where you cleaned up the Columbia River corridor first. The Energy Department didn't want to do that. The regulators didn't have that vision. And the same is true for the groundwater strategy that this site is so damn proud of. It took three years of public meetings and advice from this board, three years to have the agencies agree to and present a groundwater cleanup strategy. Can you imagine that? We didn't have a groundwater strategy until the mid 2000s. We didn't have one. The public saw it and said, where's the groundwater strategy? We're put up pump and treat here and a pump and treat there. And there is no strategy and there is no plan. But by building that consensus, you have a massive investment in billions of gallons of gr contaminated groundwater pumped and treated. And without that public consensus, it never would have happened. Without the board developing the detailed advice at the top of that pyramid of public involvement. And it required the public to choose its own representation whether it is the city of West, West Richland, or it is Tridec and the Hanford communities, or Heart of America Northwest, or brothers and sisters from labor, it's representation of those interests that allowed for us to develop that consensus. Now what we face is this, division, lack of working together for consensus, loss of expertise, and I predict this will be reflected in the division. That means less funding for the cleanup of Hanford because my organization, which has carried a lot of the load of lobbying for the cleanup of Hanford, doesn't see a damn reason to be spending billions of dollars on a vitrification plant to get the waste out of tanks so you don't contaminate the environment when the site manager sits in front of us and says, I don't give a damn if the tank keeps leaking. And what about the next five that will be leaking? The public finds that unacceptable, but if we can't sit and talk about it, and we haven't had a meeting to talk about it, and how do you engage the public in it? Then the point that this board has been able to accomplish, which is say, let's find consensus, let's find a path forward, let's unite. We're not going to unite, we're gonna say, I don't know why we spend a billion dollars a year building something when you're just letting the waste leak into the ground. And so I do hope that we, the agencies, rethink this 
as Rose Ferry said on behalf of the ACMA nation, better look for a compromise, but there is another choice. And I'm going to put this forward right now. The states of Oregon and Washington, the state of Washington has said we value that diverse input. We know the models and we know that we're building new models based on this one for our environmental justice efforts in the state of Washington. And so the states of Washington and Oregon, we can simply say, we're gonna have an advisory board because our states need diverse advice. Oregon already has one. Let's collaborate. Let's create a board that's by state, has the same representational principles, the same charter. And here's the rub. The state of Washington has authority under the Federal Facilities Compliance Act to simply charge the Energy Department for any regulatory, including public involvement effort. So we can do this. And I put forward, it's time to do it and say, we will reconvene a board. State of Washington needs a board with independent advice, not chosen by the energy department. And it can't allow the energy department to decide who sits at the table and who doesn't because the state of Washington needs that independent advice. And it needs and recognizes already that having representation choose that advice, it's uncomfortable at times, but it's worth it. And that is what we mean by having an environmental justice public involvement effort. You have to let the community choose its rep representation. It is not environmental justice. It is injustice and perpetuation of privilege to say, we're gonna choose who we wanna hear advice from. And so I put forward to you that there will be an effort and I hope that ecology EPA as well will join in and states of Oregon, Washington will discuss creating a board if the energy department thinks that the only board that exists here should be one that it dominates, chooses and decides who will sit and who will not get to raise anything because I think the state of Washington as the state of Oregon is also shown, um, believes that having diverse viewpoints give advice and try to reach consensus is worth it. So I look forward to working with everyone. We're gonna be advocating for the cleanup of Hanford um, for a long time. I was out along the Columbia River with the Yakima Nation Columbia River Keeper on Friday and I spoke about Russell Jim's mentorship. Um, I testified in front of Congress in 1991 for the Federal Facilities Compliance Act with Russell and spoke about how um, at that time, my daughter had just been born and um, I envisioned that I'd be able to hold her hand and walk safely along the shorelines of the Columbia River one day. Now she's 30. We've never had that opportunity to walk along the shorelines of the Columbia River safely. I hope her daughter or her son will walk holding her hand and know that when she puts her little toes into an upwelling that's of warm water along the shoreline, that it's clean and safe for future generations and not putting disparate risks upon the tribal nations that rely upon those waters for their life. And with that, I look forward to working with everyone. Um, and thank you all for the incredible dedication of my dear, dear friends sitting around the table and online. Thank you all. Unmute yourself. We had planned to take lunch at noon. I wanna to propose to the group that we stay for a few more minutes because we have two other people who wish to speak, Bob Suyama and Bob Thompson. So with your permission, we'll have those two gentlemen speak before we break for lunch. Bob? Yes, and like Jerry, I never let a opportunity to say something go to waste. I have a very short statement. Um, all my life, 
I've been mem a member of the Asian American minority. And as such, I've had to work harder than others just to belong. So today I'd like to thank DOE and the current administration for in the name of diversity, for determining for the first time in my life, I am part of a majority. DOE has determined that on the HAB, I am in the majority. I am old, I am male, I am too well educated, I am too experienced, and I have too much knowledge of Hanford. And I have served too long on the board. So I joined 23 of my fellow colleagues, and I love you all, because we worked together many, many years, and I am also departing the board. So I'd like to wish that the returning new members, the returning and the new members uh, to this board, every success in continuing to provide public input to the Hanford cleanup mission. And I uh, also would like to thank Jerry and I, I'd like to support Jerry's proposal for additional advisory help for ecology and uh, like them to look at that. And Jerry, I'm willing to help you on that. Thank you. Bob Thompson, you have the last word before lunch. As then everybody wants to ask you. So I'm not going to filibuster, Jerry. You weren't a politician, were you? Okay. So I knew there was going to be a day. There was going to be a day in my life, and it happened, what, six minutes ago, where I actually agreed with Jerry on something. We don't agree on policy. Uh, hell, we never do that. But that's okay, because what he said is most important. When I look at the work plan for next year, for this board, it's directed to a group of people who lost a lot of institutional knowledge. And it's amazing when you do things like that, you can direct the outcome of a board by simply directing the questions and who's on the board. Just a thought, you know, we do that. Now, again, I doubt if I, Jerry and I are gonna agree on a lot of policy issues, but that's okay. Because it really is that diversity of thought and the board and the people in the tri-party agreement need to understand that diversity is important to them too. The region needs representation and not at the dictate of the people who want to get the answer they want. And so, Jared, again, it kills me to say this, but I got to agree. Now, how we get there, I probably disagree with that, too. But it is important that the board has the opportunity to weigh in on issues that is important to the region, not cherry pick issues from the Department of Energy, not cherry pick issues from Washington's Department of Ecology and not cherry pick from the Department of Ecology. We have thoughts too. That's why we're an advisory board. There's a lot of talent. We're losing a lot of talent. But doesn't everybody kind of resent it when they make you kind of run down that little funnel to the tube that they want you to run out when you know that there's bigger issues out there that should be considered by the board? It's a thought. And so again, Jerry, I don't know if it's a good day or a bad day. But I got to admit, I agree with you on something. That's it. With that, I invite you to enjoy lunch with each other. We will get back at 1.30 Pacific time, and we'll talk about the Circle of Five-Year Review. Thank you for your time this morning. Okay, they can hear us, they can see us. Mike, are you gonna jump in or do we need to have somebody introduce you? All right, just hug that mic and then people will hear you and the recording will pick you up. Okay, can you hear me? <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna wait for that. Okay, so my name is Mike Klein. I am the director for the Soil and Groundwater Division with Department of Energy. 
and under soil and groundwater, we uh, remediate the groundwater, of course, but we do all the decision documents, uh, all the records of decision we gather for soil and groundwater. Uh, one of my coworkers does the soil remediation portion, uh, but I, we do the groundwater. So that's kind of where we are. We also run all the sampling and monitoring programs for the site. Next slide, please. Okay, so start out with some basics. What's CERCLA? Uh, you can read that Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. CERCLA gives us the authority to go do the cleanup work. Without a CERCLA record of decision, we do not have authority to go forth and clean up. Uh, the record of decision is concurred with by the regulators, EPA and Ecology, and together the three of us have made a decision to go do something and then DOE goes through and implements it. So some of the goals of CERCLA are, are of course, protect human health and the environment, um, make responsible parties pay for cleanup work. Now that really doesn't apply here with DOE because we are the government and we are responsible for the cleanup. But in the commercial world, uh, they have the authority to go after the responsible parties and try to recover the costs. So that's more of a commercial type thing. Uh, some of the goals here are also to involve the communities in the circle process. Um, this is one venue where we try to do that. Um, and we try to return the circle sites to productive use. There will be portions of Hanford that probably won't be returned to productive use. Where the canyons are up on the central plateau, that will probably be institutional controls forever. We will be watching that. But there are a lot of areas along the river corridor where we will be returning uh, at least to recreational use. And those are called out in the, uh, the comprehensive land use policy and in the records of decision themselves. They do talk a little bit about that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so CERCLA five-year reviews, we do every five years. This is the fifth five-year review. Uh, we started back in, I think, 1995, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we, we go through and we do an evaluation and the main uh, product out of this is a determination whether it's protective. And that determination is based on the record of decision and the work that's being performed. Okay, so required by statute that we do the five-year cleanup or the five-year review on how we're doing cleanup. Um, normally in commercial world, EPA would do it. For federal facilities, because they're large and complex, the agency normally prepares a report submits it to EPA, EPA concurs with the protectiveness determination or doesn't concur. And, and that's up to EPA, but we do work with EPA as we're developing this um, because we want a concurrence. We want everyone to be in agreement. So uh, the past couple of them went through and EPA concurred uh, with no changes. Uh, the first couple, I think there were changes, but we did change it between uh, the third and the fourth review uh, we streamlined it per EPA's request, um, and we only deal with the uh, operable units that have some form of decision. Um, and we don't repeat anything. If we can reference to another document that describes, we do that so we can maintain some consistency. If you start to put the same information in two different documents, they will diverge and they will start to become inconsistent. So we were considerate of that when we were trying to put this thing together. And that was actually five years ago. This this round, uh, we pretty much used that same template and it went through pretty good. So continue to be required as long as a hazardous substance or pollutant or contamination remain on site. We will probably do these for some time in the future uh, because some of the hazardous substances on the plateau will be there for a while. Uh, and we also include technical assessments and that's part of the report. Based on the assessments, we make a determination uh, determinations are not protective, will be protective, protective in the short term, or they are protective. Um, and I'll go through and kind of itemize out which ones we had. We did not have any that were not protective. Next slide, please. Okay, so this, this scope uh, of this review went from January 2016 to December of 2020. Uh, we have three national priority list sites. Uh, 100, 200, and 300 areas. Um, and the operable units have been established with, within these sites. 30 OUs with rods or I rods were addressed in this review. 23 source OUs, which is soil, and seven groundwater OUs. 
will use operable units in case I didn't say that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as I said, DOE was the lead agency here. We actually developed a report uh, with input from EPA and ecology. Um, and we proceeded forward and we tried to keep them in the loop as we were going so that we would have a final document that would not need revision and that everyone could concur with. Uh, EPA manages the, the CERCLA on site and they did concur with the protectiveness determination, uh, the issues and the recommendations that were included. And I'll go through those in a little bit. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, the little flow sheet here comes right out of the EPA guidance and you basically just follow it down and, and see where you end up at the bottom. Most of ours ended up uh, either under construction or operating remedy um, and came down to be will protective, protective in short term or are protective. Next slide, any questions on this flow sheet? Next slide, please. Okay, so of all the OUs on the Hanford site, no protectiveness statements were for 17 of them because there were no IROD, there were no ROD. Uh, IROD is an interim record of decision, meaning we still will be doing a final evaluation of it or a ROD, which is a record of decision. Uh, some people like to refer to that as final. There's really no such thing. It's a record of decision. And if something needs to change later on, it changes. So. Um, I, I try to stay away from final versus interim, but the interim rods do have that in their name, so we do call it out. Um, 17 did not have those, and we did not address them in the report. They will be addressed when decisions are made. You can't really make a determination if something is protective according to the decision that was made unless you have the decision. So uh, not protective, there were no OUs in the not protective category. There were 18 OUs in the will be protective, which pretty much means we're working the remedy, we're not done, it will be protective when we're done. Um, protective in the short term, there were four OUs because there were some issues uh, that we're working on and we will be making a few changes. And then protective, there were eight OUs that were just flat out protective. Most of them are long uh, on their way to implementing this remedy and we don't see any issues with the with those at this time. Next slide, please. So at a glance, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this one, but at a glance, you can kind of see where the OUs fall and the names are a little cryptic, but anything 100K, whether it's KR1 or KR2 is in the 100K area, same with 100N, same with 100D. Um, the ones that are bold are actual groundwater operable units and the ones that are normal are soil operable units. So for example, you look at K, there's two soil units and there's a groundwater unit associated with it. And they're all in close proximity to each other. It's just, that's the way the OUs were laid out and based on the geographical areas. Um, so it shows you the ones that will be protective, uh, the ones that are protective in the short term and the ones that are protective, deemed to be protective. Questions? Next slide. Okay, now this shows you on the map a little bit of where these operable units are in relation to the site. If you look up in the upper left corner, you see the entire site, but you see we're really focused on that one area. Uh, we call it the horn. It's where the site uh, juts up to the north along the Columbia River there. And you can see the areas, the, the BC, the K, the N, the D, uh, H area, F area. And if you continue down that path, you'd see in the, the little insert in the upper right, shows the 300 area because there are some OUs in the 300 area. Those are considered the river corridor operable units. Just to give you an idea where they, where they lay on the site. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide actually shows the operable units on the central plateau. Uh, the ones in 200 east area, ones in, in 200 west, and, and it lays out. There's quite a few different operable units there, uh, mostly soil, there's four groundwater operable units on the central plateau. Uh, you have a pretty much north and south of west area and a north and south of east area. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so some of the issues that we came up with. Uh, PFAS, PFAS is an emerging issue. Uh, it, it hasn't really 
been finalized. EPA has yet to promulgate cleanup levels, uh, but we do know it is an issue. It's an issue across the country. Uh, it's mostly a, a foam uh, chemical that was used for firefighting. Um, and as recent, it's been identified as having some, some problems with health and human health. And so we do need to look at it. To date, we did do some sampling uh, probably about five years ago at the 400 area where we have the one and only drinking water well. And at the time, the concern was over drinking water. Go assess what your drinking water has in it as far as PFAS. Since then, it's been expanded to all groundwater. And so we are going to uh, look at an assessment to determine, is there an impact? Is there an issue? Uh, when we did the sampling in the 400 area, we could not detect any PFAS chemicals. Um, we thought we were good. Now we're going to expand that out, probably concentrate where the firehouses are, where the training for firefighters were, any known areas where we may have dispersed any of the chemicals, uh, and we will start looking for it there. And that is the first step, to assess the problem, see what's there. Um, and this is not being done hampered, it's being done DOE complex-wide. So it's across the country that they are going to start assessing these. Um, once we get the assessment, we will take it from there. There could be some corrective actions. There could be a lot of different things. But until we get that assessment done to see, is there even an issue here? Uh, we, we're not going to move too much further uh, and see where we're at. OK, so that's issue number one. And that applies. Um, it's, it's not labeled as OU because that pretty much applies across the site. It will cross many OUs when we do that assessment. Uh, next issue we had was FR3-1. Uh, the the 100 BC rod uh, put a standard in there. It was an ARAR, which is, we called you here, Stephanie, help me what ARAR stands for again. Well, EPA's here. What the fast ARAR okay. on the table. Applicable, relevant, and I don't know what the last R is. I'm okay. drawing blank. Applicable. Applicable. applicable, relevant, and something. Right. Act applicable regulation. I have Google, so it, let me Google it. It's where we pull in other requirements that aren't necessarily CERCLA, but could have some applicability. And it's the substantive part of the requirement, not the administrative part that we do follow. And one of those requirements said that if there's water, groundwater that can go to surface water, you need to look at the surface water cleanup requirements. Um, the cleanup requirement for groundwater is 48 micrograms per liter. The cleanup requirement for aquatic standards is 10. So we have imposed a 10 micrograms per liter uh, chromium limit on the groundwater in the BC5 area. So, um, and that will, you'll see this issue again because that will probably expand into some of the other units. Some already have records of decision, some don't, we're working on them. So we will be looking at that. Um, and that is the same one for the next issue. Um, Mike, I have it. It's applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements. And I did know that uh, it's because Laura Bilo is not here. She would have given me such a look of judgment for not remembering that acronym. <laughs> Sorry about that. We get too used to acronyms and we <laughs> tend to forget what they stand for sometimes. Okay, so uh, the next issue, the that looks like both those issues are the same, so I don't understand. Okay, uh, KR4, uh, we had some of the same issue there that uh, we haven't finished the ecological risk assessment. We will still look at PFAS there too, but we, we haven't finished the ecological risk assessment. We have a interim action rod uh, that was put together 10 years, 10 plus years ago to get something started. As I said, we're not authorized to do anything without some type of a decision. We had a decision made. It did not include a full-blown ecological risk assessment. It didn't include some of the other things, but it was put together so that we can go out and start digging the source up and start treating the groundwater and taking care of things before it continued to hit the river. So we will, and we are working on a final RIFS proposed plan and get a final decision or a, a, a record of decision for the K area. It will be evaluating whether we need to go to 10 micrograms per liter or the 48 that, that the groundwater standards based on. Um, but it hasn't been finalized and we are working with the EPA 
to, to get that decision made. Um, so we will be work continuing that. Uh, 100N area, um, pretty much the same thing. We had a interim rod to begin working on it. We installed a, a appetite barrier over part of it, and we will expand that depending on what the final record of decision uh, determines. Um, but we are still working it. It has not been finalized. It does not have a, a full record of decision. Okay, so the next one's over at UP1, uh, which is a operable unit around U plant on the southern portion of West area. Um, and we need to do some additional characterization to better define the tech technetium 99 uh, and UP1 does have an interim rod, even though it did have a ecological assessment. Um, there were some unanswered questions when they were issuing the rod, uh, some on chromium, some on technetium 99. And so that was an interim rod that was issued uh, so that we can continue to collect data, but continue to do cleanup while we're doing it. Uh, we are pumping water from UP1 over to the two west pump and tree and treating it for uranium and technetium. <clears throat> okay, the next issue is a, a ZP1, which is the north portion of West Area groundwater. Um, and when we got that rod, when it was issued, it was based on an, an assumption of the degradation of the carbon tetrachloride. Uh, that assumption later turned to be not what we thought it should be. I don't want to say invalid, but there is some validity to it, but it's going to take much longer than that assumption thought it would. Um, so the 150 years may not be achieved without doing some additional work. And we have been doing some additional work. We are concentrating on the carbon tech. We're increasing capacity to try and pull as much of that out of the ground as we can. Um, but that is still an issue. And, and that is one of the, the things we identified that we still need to work on. Okay, so these reports are available, publicly available from the Hanford.gov website. Um, go to the docs menu or from the administrative record. It can come up either way. Um, the next comprehensive review will be from 2021 to 2025. And the report will come out in 2027 because we have to wait till we get all the data in in 25, uh, which is collected all the way through December of that year. Uh, it gets evaluated. We start, uh, or it gets analyzed first. And then we start evaluating the results of the analytical data and we will put the report together and it takes about a year and a half to get the report fully developed and through the review process and approved. Are there any questions? Let me suggest that we check in with the regulators and then go to questions. Okay. If that's okay. Um, and we do have, we will have questions. Um, Oh, they're pointing at you, Roberto. We're going to start with you. Uh, Dustin? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, my name is Roberto Armijo from the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, I just want to highlight that uh, we appreciate the collaboration that we've done with DOE and in conjunction with the uh, Department of Ecology uh, on, the five -year, on the development of the five year review report. I uh, also wanted to clarify that the 1100 area uh, was included in the scope of this five-year review, uh, regardless of the NPL listing, the national priority list, listing, uh, due to having uh, waste left in place. Just wanted to clarify that. And in early May, EPA issued a letter of concurrence, uh, concurrence with the protectiveness determinations. Uh, additionally, our agency highlighted a, uh, a concern regarding uh, the lead uh, federal agency's uh, uh, outreach activities uh, during the development of the report. Uh, while they met the minimum requirements uh, that were expected out of CERCLA, we expected uh, greater uh, outreach to, <clears throat> uh, to match with the complexity of the Hanford site. And uh, with that, uh, that's Pretty much it, yeah. Thank you. Ecology, do you have anything to add? Thanks, Ruth. This is Stephanie Schleif again. Uh, so I have a quick statement, and then if there are any technical questions, our uh, lead for the five-year review, Alicia Boyd, is on, so she can help answer any questions that Ecology may have, or folks that have for Ecology. 
Uh, we would like to express our appreciation for being involved in the comment resolution process along with EPA on the five-year review report. This allowed all of the agencies to stay informed as portions of the documents were updated, especially as protectiveness determinations were updated for some of the operable units. That's it for me. Thanks, Ruth. All right. We've got four folks in queue. Again, if you're in the room, put your name tent on its side. If you're online, let us know in chat and we will add you. Um, are there any people who are only with us on phone who want to be put in queue? Phone folks? We have very quiet phone people today. All right, Liz, we're gonna kick off with Liz and then go to Rob, Chris, and Jerry. Liz. Thanks, Ruth. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Mick, for your presentation. Um, I just became aware of the PFAS issue, the P, I think that's how you say it, the acronym, um, PFAS. Is that right? PFAS? PFAS. Um, and I was wondering if you, um, and so thanks for sharing that information. I have a few or two questions. One is where I can find more information or what documents might have more information about um, the work that's been done so far in PFAS at Hanford. And the second is if there's a contact person to get more information or a point person at, at DOE, and maybe that's you right now um, for follow-up questions. Who's the PFAS guru at Hanford? I don't know that I'm a guru, but I will talk a little bit about that. Um, to date, we really haven't done any assessments on PFAS yet. We're gearing up and we're getting policy from headquarters and how they want to handle it. Uh, the only thing we have done, and it was many years ago, was take the groundwater or the drinking water sample from the 400 area. It was non-detectable. And really, that's about it. There wasn't really a lot to, to uh, look into at that point. Uh, we are just starting uh, to look at how we're going to do this assessment. So it's really too early to say one way or the other or, or provide any information on that because we just don't have it yet. OK. Um, so who is there a person that's in charge of that program? Would it be, or, or, is it you? Pardon? Is there a person within DOE that would be a good contact to ask? So if somebody wanted to contact a DOE person to talk technical about PFAS, who would they call? You can call me and I'll get you to the right person. Okay. I have some staff that know a little bit about it. They're starting to get involved in it, but at this point, you know, call me and, and we'll find the right person depending on what your question is. All right. I've got Rob and then Chris. Rob, you're in the room. Thanks a lot, Mike. <laughs> it was a good, <clears throat> good time. <clears throat> I'd like to know uh, a little bit about the impact on our, our advice on your program and in particular we have advice on RTD, remove, treat, dispose. How does this factor in into the determination of whether a method is protective or not? And, and then the second question I'd have to just to multiply there is that, do you consider time, decay, attenuation in your determination of protectiveness? Okay, I'm not sure I followed all of the question. Um, I think some of it was, how does it impact with the TSDs, the recre units? Well, you're, you're on page six. You have your how you determine whether a cleanup method or something is protected. So does our advice have any impact on the, the, what is the determination of something as protected? And then my other question is, is that when you determine something's protective, and it's going to be a 10 year thing. Do you look at it from the standpoint of time? Like at the end of the time of the cleanup, it would be protective or kind of, kind of just boil down a little bit into what's used to say it's protective. So, so when we go through this, this little flow sheet, and that's what you're referring to, um, we, we look at 
based on the rod, based on the record of decision, what the record of decision told us to do, if we're implementing it, and if we are progressing with the time frame in the record of decision. And for the example, the, the issue on ZP1, we are not progressing per the time frame in the record of decision. And so that is an issue. And we realize there's some something going on there and we're we're working to take care of it. But this is all based on the remedy. Are you protective in accordance with the remedy? PFAS comes up and it's not part of the remedy. It's not part of anything. It wasn't there when we issued these records of decision. And so we realized that and we identified that as an issue that will probably go across the board on all the units um, to look at what the impacts are to PFAS. I don't know if that's answering your question. You're giving me a look like, well, no. <laughs> okay, how about this? Um, if we need to support your work for this kind of understanding here of what's protective and not, what kind of advice would you want from the board? So, and that's why I said is that we've got almost 300 advice points out there mm -hmm. that have a lot to do with, and some of them have a lot to do with our values of remove, treat, and dispose is one of them. Um, does that factor into this determination of protectiveness? And and what, you, what I just gathered from you is that, wait a minute, that determination is up in the engineering of the rod. Mm -hmm. They're, th they're going to create a so, clean up thing that's going to be protected, right? Or So input is factored into making the decision, the record of decision. The, the five-year review is based on, are you doing what the record of decision told you to do to be protective? If you do what the record of decision tells you to do, then you should be protective unless something's wrong with that remedy or that record of decision in which case we would have to reopen up the record of decision and amend it. And there are some times when we will do that. Um, but this determination is based solely on the remedy that was given in the record of decision. And are we on track to meet that remedy? Because that remedy was determined to be protective once completed. And that's what the record of decision is. Here's your decision. Here's what you need to go do. And then you should be protective. Uh, but it gets evaluated every five years. And if we find things like PFAS to show up, we need to deal with that. So that's why I say no record of decision is truly final because things change, you know, and these are records of decision that go hundreds of years. Things will change. New technologies will be out there. There will be different things that can be done. But right now, this determination is based on what did the record of decision tell us to do for remedy? Are we implementing that? Are we progressing towards cleaning that? And are we gonna meet that timetable? And the ones that will be protective, yeah, there's some things we're still doing. They will be protective. The ones in the short term are like the ZP1. We know there's an issue, it's protective in the short term, but it's gonna run much longer than we ever envisioned. And so it's not totally protective at this point. We need to do some changes to get it back in that time frame. Does that answer? understand uh, yeah alicia you're on the phone would do you have anything to add to this the only piece that i was going to add to what mike said is that um, those protectiveness determinations are defined by epa so how to determine if it's effective is is it's already defined in guidance from epa so but mike is absolutely appropriate that all of the advice goes into developing the records of decision, and then the protectiveness determinations are based on what was in that record of decision. That's it. Thank you. All right, are you good, Rob? Would you do me a favor and put Bob's card down too? I, we, look, we look for those and it, it, it confuses us. All right. I've got Chris and then Jerry and Richard. Chris. Yeah. Hi, Mike. I have three questions. In the circle five-year review for UP1, there's a short discussion on iodine-129. It says that currently you're using hydraulic containment uh, to stop it from migrating and, and the plume from expanding. And then the report also indicates that several studies have indicated that there are no effective, they did not find effective technologies to remediate item 129. What's your latest thinking on item 129? 
Okay, at this point, we are containing iodine-129, which is what the record of decision told us to do. We put three injection wells at the eastern, southeastern uh, area of the plume to create a hydraulic barrier, so to speak, uh, to contain that plume. We did do some uh, re literature reviews and we had PNL research into, are there any uh, feasible technologies that would take care of the iodine? I know we looked at some work they're doing down in Savannah River with silver nitrates. Uh, that was determined that that would not work with our species of iodine and with our geology, our, our formation. Um, and so right now we're, we're struggling at what we can do with the iodine. We're still looking at it, um, but it doesn't look very promising to have uh, much that we can do with the iodine at this point, but watch it, contain it, and see where it goes. If it's not going anywhere, let it sit there. Uh, if it is going somewhere, we're going to have to do something about it. So we're still in the, in the phases of looking at that. Um, we did determine there were no technologies available that would treat it. Uh, that were feasible to use uh, in the field, um, and we're we're still evaluating what we can do with it, and we're working with EPA to to make that determination. Chris, did I hear you had more than one question? Okay, let's put Chris back in queue because I could have sworn he said he had more than one, but it looks like he's frozen up. So let's go to Jerry and, and we'll circle back to Chris. Jerry? Thank you. Um, so the five-year review is basically in a nutshell to determine if the remedy in place is still protective and the protectiveness determination, of course, revolves around human exposure uh, and ecological. But my question is focusing on human exposure. And, um, you know, we have remedies that will take 250 years, 150 years to be accomplished. And my question is where in the entire review? That I look for, um, I will find a, an examination of whether or not the operable units are safe under the tribal use exposure scenario, which is guaranteed under treaty rights. And the second part of my question is, we're supposed to, uh, under the law, review uses of an area, not just a paperwork exercise, but are there new uses? And so if tribes are now entering an area or seeking to enter an area that um, uh, they weren't when the rod was put in place, that would trigger presumably a new examination. So I couldn't find anything in the review. Is it not there? Did you not look at tribal exposures and how, if so, how does this comport with each agency's commitment to environmental justice and honoring treaty rights since the treaties don't say that you have to wait 150 years to be able to use your usual and accustomed lands and resources? I'd have to look at more specifics on that, um, but uh... Maybe Roberto can help out a little bit with the tribal rights scenario. Yeah, so regarding the tribal rights scenario, I don't have a whole lot of information on that right now. I can't get back to you on that if you like. Um, but my understanding is that the protection determinations, they're based off of uh, what is determined in the record of decisions. And that also incorporates the, uh, the future land use as well. So the record of decisions for all these units uh, along the river um, uh, chose not to consider treaty rights and tribal use scenario to, as a basis for standards. And Upland, the Energy Department, in one of the most abusive uh, decisions in regard to uh, environmental justice and commitments has said that it believes that it actually abrogated 
treaty rights in the central plateau, which anyone who studies environmental tribal law knows that energy department can't abrogate treaty rights, but that's what the energy department has said in this, uh, its comprehensive future site use, uh, um, the land use document mm -hmm. that is the basis for this plan and the review. So um, are you even asking the tribes or did you just exercise, do this exercise on paper? Did you ask the tribes if they are seeking to or actually um, uh, entering areas that are within the operable units or if they seek to do so as part of the review or did you just do a paper review? So, so we did send the report to the tribes. They did review it. We did meet with the tribes and discuss their concerns. Okay. So as far as the report actually goes, no, you probably will not find that in the report because the report deals with the record of decision and what you're referring to really should have been brought up during the development of the record of decision and, and possibly, you know, change the record of decision in some point. Um, most of these records of decision uh, have been around for a while. And so environmental justice wasn't in place at that time. And I know part of environmental justice will be looking at, are there things that do need to change uh, that we're doing currently that don't match what we should be doing for environmental justice. So then that's something that's fairly new, the environmental justice, we're getting a handle on it. Um, and it's really not something I'm working on, so I can't talk too much about it. Our communications group could probably talk more about the environmental justice um, and, and possibly Roberto, he's been involved in some of that. I would just urge this board to work with our tribes in developing advice. It's uh, it is a very, very sad response to say, well, the records of decision didn't consider environmental justice and tribal use, and we're not looking at it in that this is somehow new. Of course, the tribes have been asking for the use of the tribal exposure scenario for more than two decades. Um, so I would urge this board to work with the tribes in developing advice about how to reopen this review for protectiveness and include tribal exposure scenarios and to explicitly reject the land use plans assertion that you don't have to consider tribal exposures on central plateau because the U.S. Department of Energy decided that it irretrievably and irreversibly committed natural resources um, to contamination and abrogated treaty rights somehow, which is literally what it says in the plan. But so a lot just, of that is really beyond this review. This is a review of the protectiveness based on the remedies we have in place. This, if they need to okay, change. So, uh, so I Klein, have, I have, I, I have done, somebody, let Jerry. Say, Mr. I, Klein, let me just say, the law requires review of protectiveness, not just a review of your paperwork. And when circumstances change, you're supposed to examine those circumstances. So if you relied on a fence and the fence is no longer effective, you have to consider that in the five-year review. Right. And I'm so, urging you to look at that, including the tribal uses that may have changed. So I have life. somebody from the tribe in queue. So both of you take a breath. And I'm gonna ask Marissa for her perspective. Marissa, I see your hand. Hi, thank you. Um, the Nez Perce tribe has been asking for a tribal youth risk assessment to be included for many years. This isn't something new. Um, so I just, I just wanted to add that. Okay. I didn't follow that question. Um, Marissa, I'm gonna, would you restate what you said? Um, folks didn't hear it quite as clearly as you wanted. Can you repeat yourself? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear her? Can you hear Marissa? No. Okay. Marissa, hug, hug the microphone and try again, please. 
Sorry, I think my microphone wasn't working. Can you hear me now? Oh, that's much better. Okay. Um, the Nez Perce tribe has been asking for um, native land use scenarios and risk assessments for many years. This isn't something new, and um, that was prior to um, prior to any of these any of these rods. Um, I just uh, wanted to add that to this discussion. Um, so the DOE and EPA and um, has has known that. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to Chris Sutton. We've got him back online, and I know he had more than one question, but we lost him. Chris, are you back with us? Yes. So, okay. Mike, here's my second question. On slides 12 and 14 in your presentation through 14, um, you indicate a number of several issues and, and recommendations for various operable units. And each recommendation ends with a milestone date. Um, are you on track to meet those milestone dates? At this point, yes, we are. Um, those are not actual TPA milestones. Those are just milestone dates in this in this review. Um, but yes, we are on track to look at those and, and meet those. Okay. And here's my third question. And this isn't strictly speaking about the circle five year review, but it does have to do with groundwater cleanup. Um, in your task order with CPC code, the end states and, and uh, ops task order, there are two end states, one of which requires you to develop a long-term uh, long management plan that describes an accelerated cleanup strategy for groundwater and vado zone remediation on the central plateau. And the second one uh, requires the development of an implementation plan uh, to implement that accelerated long-term central plateau cleanup strategy. Um, are those plans underway in development now or have they been completed and are they in the public domain? They're in the very preliminary stages, and I really can't say too much on that because the whole task order is under negotiation at this point. So we okay. don't really have a final task order. We have, this is the work we want done, and we are negotiating with the contractor to uh, see what it's gonna to take to get that done. But yes, we do want the overall strategy for the Central Plateau. We've wanted that for a while. We're, we have started that, we've worked on it. Uh, we do have a comprehensive plume evaluation where we're looking at the the effect of the plumes from the central plateau as a whole across the plateau, not just as a from operable unit to operable unit, because the plumes don't seem to recognize our operable unit boundaries. So we need to treat them as one, one whole uh, unit and see what it's going to take to actually do some of that cleanup. But yes, we are starting on it, but we, we haven't finished it. And when we will finish it is what we're negotiating right now with the contractor. Okay. So I can't say too much about that. Okay, so, but sometime in the future, that might be that might be a good briefing for the HAB. Once the task order is finalized, that probably would be a good briefing. Okay, thank you, Mike. Right, I've got Richard and Dan Strong. Richard. Um, yeah, as as the HAB moves forward, the you know, we're losing a lot of the institutional knowledge that, that went with the development of all these rods and mm -hmm. the arguments that went in place. Um, I, it's just a comment I wanted to throw out there. The RAP committee probably would be as the new, as the new members populate that RAP committee to go through this again in, in subcommittee just to give the big picture of what what's out there, because we know they're going to be ignorant of all the rods that existed, all the history of the hundred area rods that went in place, and also, I mean, to me, the document there there was some comments earlier complaining that we didn't get to comment on your review. Well, your review is just simply that it's a summary. And it's a very good summary of what's gone on circular wise. Um, but my previous suggestion of putting single shell tanks into the circular would probably make your review very more 
uh, complicated. <laughs> you are correct. And it is a summary. In fact, what we do is we. It's we a good the, summary. That's that's we, what I was trying. We to take the at. annual reports for the past five years and we compile them and we summarize them and. and we reference back to those annual reports because we don't want to repeat that same information, um, just makes a bulky report. Uh, but you're right, it is really a summary because uh, on the commercial world, they probably don't do this, but here we do it annually. We evaluate all the plumes and all the pump and treats on an annual basis and publish that in a report. And this is more of a formal uh, declaration by EPA and the agency, our DOE, that we are protective or not protective, but Informally, we do that annually in the annual pump and treat or the annual groundwater report. Right. We also have uh, pump and treat reports that we publish annually that tell you how the pump and treat systems are working specific uh, to any one OU. Uh, the annual report kind of sums it up. It has plume maps and so forth. And a lot of that we draw from that for this report. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. It's already out there. Um, we do that. The only real work we have to do is the last year we don't have an annual report for it yet. So we do have to look at that. And, and that is some of the time frame is because we kind of wait for that annual report to get drafted so we can start pulling stuff from it for the final year. Um, but we will actually put this report together with the four years, um, do some evaluations, make some determinations, throw the data in from the last year. And usually it does not change much, if anything, um, because what you've been doing for four years, the fifth year is pretty much following suit, you know, unless something drastic changed or significant changed, uh, which normally doesn't, but we will address that if it does happen. So you're right, it is a compilation of much of the work we've been doing on a yearly basis. Right, and and it is the, it's, it's the history which RAP is really having. It's a great history document for the RAP committee. And, so. and you are correct, we're losing our institutional knowledge. And I see that walking out the door every day. And that's certain. And, and so a lot of the, the upfront paperwork, a lot of the investigative work um, where we use process knowledge to, as a starting point, we're trying to get that done before that leaves and at least have that much documented and on the shelf so we can draw from that when we go to do the proposed plan and get the final rod. Thank you. All right, Dan Strom, you're online and I see your hand. Let's get you off a of mute. Can, I'm trying to do that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have spoken before about the various kinds of risk that are discussed in the context of Hanford cleanup. Uh, if your concern is radiation protection rather than cleanup, uh, there is something that can be done to strongly mitigate the potential health risk from iodine-129. The principle of mass action has been used for many decades in human patients in the medical profession. The principle works by diluting radioactive iodine with non-radioactive or stable iodine. And at Hanford, um, I tried to find out how much iodine-125 there is on the Hanford site. I had a lot of trouble. I put in the chat my calculation that um, about 81 kilograms of I-129 has been produced in the entire history of Hanford. And uh, along with that, about 14 kilograms of iodine-127, which is the stable non-radioactive iodine. The principle of mass action in protecting human patients from concentrating iodine in the human thyroid, which is the critical organ and the organ that gets uh, 99 percent of the radiation dose what you do is just administer a thing called lugol solution which is just stable uh, sodium iodide and that uh, protects um, the thyroid by blocking it just dilutes the radioactive iodine uh, this principle is behind the iodine tablets that are available after nuclear reactor accidents, which were used after Chernobyl, for example, in lots of countries in Europe. Uh, and you just give somebody the iodine pill and all of the radioactive iodine that they inhale just immediately gets excreted instead of being concentrated in the thyroid. And so what you could do at Hanford, if you cared about, about reducing dose to people, would be to let the iodine go and then dilute it 
with non-radioactive iodine. So, for example, if you were able to add 81 kilograms of non-radioactive iodine, that is I-127, to the plume I where the I-129 is and the tanks and wherever the sources are, if you added an equal amount, you'd cut the radiation dose in half. And this isn't news. Um, if you added, instead of 81 kilograms, if you added 810 kilograms, roughly a ton, you cut the dose by a factor of 10, actually 11. If you added, uh, instead of a ton, if you added 10 tons of stable iodine, you'd cut the dose and all future doses by a factor of 100. Bringing them down to a level that is just absolutely beneath any regulatory concern. Now I'm going to finish by repeating what I said at the beginning. If you care about radiation risk, now if you care about keeping the Columbia River pristine, then you can ignore everything I've said. Thank you. Is there a question there? Dan, I didn't hear a question. Is that accurate? I don't think there was a question. Okay. Are there any final questions or comments before we take a break? Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Do you want to say something, to Mr. Chairman? Yeah, I just, uh, when you think about the future of the site, it goes beyond the immediate decisions that are being made and it goes into the philosophy of what we're trying to accomplish. And at some point, I believe this board or whatever replaces this board is gonna to have to deal with the sociological and justice issues associated with 100 years from now, 1000 years from now, how this site is gonna be used. And I think what we're headed for right now is it will be in some form a sacrifice zone. It already is. But in what manner are we going to be able to allow treaty rights to be reinstated or not? And where, whether or not there will be human access allowed um, and how it would happen. And I know that's not really on the agenda for what um, the board is allowed to deal with right now. But at some point, it's going to have to start having those conversations because end states is beyond five years, beyond 10 years, but it's out there. And, and as we have talked about before, you sort of got to have the end in mind when you're doing some of these actions. I don't have the answer, but I believe that in some manner, this board is going to have to be allowed to talk about that. Over. Okay, this is your last nag. If you have not yet voted for interim chair and interim vice chair, please do so at break. Either send an email to habitslin.net or see Josh or Lacey back in the corner for a paper ballot. Um, it's important. So with that, let's break until 2.45. We've got the sound working, so we're good. So Lacey, yeah. you're the only one that has seen the votes. We did it that way so they'd be as confidential as we could. So tell us what happened, but you have to talk in the mic. Okay, so we had 21 people vote and it was a unanimous yes for Jan Cottrell as interim ch chair and for Susan Coleman as vice chair. <laughs> yeah, quorum is 19, so that's the, that's the magic number right now. All right. But you're still it till the end of the meeting. Oh, rats. I mean, good. <laughs> All right. So next up, 
is the work plan, the draft work plan for fiscal year 23. I am going to pull up the draft work plan. So Gary, I probably should have asked you this before now, but I'm asking you now. Um, are you going to do the Cliff Notes version of the work plan and walk through it? Yes. Do you want to start with the calendar or the work plan? Let's start with the work plan. Okay. There are, if you are in the room and you need a copy, there's some black and white copies at the back, um, or you may have been picked one up when you came in. Um, online, I'm showing it on screen. It can also be found online at the Hanford.gov website. So a couple different ways to access it. Ready, set, go, Gary. Well, good afternoon, folks. And I think I am what's standing between us and hitting the street for the day. So I am going to try to go through this answer the questions, but not belabor a lot of things. And uh, so hopefully we can get out of here and enjoy some of the sunshine out there. Uh, first off, uh, we've gone through this several times in, in the various committees. So thank you to everybody who has provided input. Uh, also wanna thank uh, Ecology and EPA for being a part of that process. Uh, doing this in collaboration makes it a better document. Uh, this is not a perfect document, but it is a reasonably good one. It is also written in Jello, which means that we expect that there will be some changes as we go throughout the year, because as you've heard more than once that no plan survives first contact but we have a roadmap here that hopefully will guide us through the year starting in October. Uh, I've got it. Uh, most of you have read some of the uh, early part of uh, the uh, first few pages of this document. Uh, page four is really uh, a spot where if you can scroll to page four, please. kind of explains some of the changes that we're looking at. And a comment that we've heard more than once is uh, public engagement, public involvement, and how do we do that better? One of the things that we're looking at is changing the timing on the board meeting to uh, allow the opportunity for the public to be more engaged. And to do that, we're going to remain in a two-day time period, but we're going to alter it the first day uh, so that we can add an evening component so that those who can't participate during the daytime, during work hours, can participate hopefully in the evening. So what we're looking at on day one for the uh, uh, board meeting is we'll start at 1 p.m. and go into 4 p.m. That'll give us a chance to take care of any sort of uh, board business that needs to be taken care of. We'll break for one hour and then we will have an evening component from 5 until 8 p.m. And that's where we'll do the presentations, similar to what you heard this morning and we kicked off the meeting. We will then shift the uh, updates to the evening uh, portion, that way hopefully we'll be reaching out to more public members and hopefully get some more public uh, interaction and, and discourse with that. Uh, the next day, we will have a normal board meeting. Uh, the second day running from nine to 11 and then one to four. And we also recognize that there may be some times that that can change. Uh, if we have less of a, an agenda that needs to be dealt with, we could probably eliminate or change some of the timings. Like I said, th this is a, uh, a draft document subject to change. Uh, most of the other items on here you, you've seen and you've lived through before on committee meetings, uh, committee of the whole meetings, issue manager meetings, et cetera. 
as we uh, flip toward page five, please. You'll, you'll see the work plan in two different ways. What I've done is kind of map it out by month in words so that we see kind of where things are. And the way this is written, looking at October, the first uh, portion that you see is October 4th, the committee, and then you'll see something in parentheses. So what we're trying to do is match topics written out to topics on the work plan that you'll see in, in a uh, in an ex, uh, mini Excel sheet. It has to kind of match things up for better understanding of, of where things are happening. We're also looking at splitting things up instead of having the long committee week that we've been having in the past where all four committees can meet over four days, uh, we're splitting that up. Uh, it also helps out staff particularly and uh, uh, also helps with, with some contractual issues, getting information out to uh, committees and things like that. So what we're doing is looking at having two committees one month two committees the next month. And we think that that will give us a little bit uh, better breathing room. There's also a lot of people who get a chance to uh, attend many meetings, and this will give them an opportunity to breathe and digest some of that information before the next meeting comes along. Uh, everybody is invited to all of the different committee meetings and all of the committee meetings are public. Uh, so, we want people to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. And, and let's see how this goes and, and how it works with uh, uh, staff and, and with everybody's you know, schedules and things like that. Hopefully it, it will help out with folks there. Uh, looking ahead toward uh, October 19th and 20th, uh, that is when we're going to have the first board meeting in this new format and see how that works. So in the morning of the night, excuse me, the afternoon of the 19th, we'll have board business. The evening of the 19th, we're going to have uh, department updates. And then the plan is to go through and let the major contractors on the installation talk about their scope of work and what it is they're doing and how they fit into the one Hanford scheme and how they're helping us get cleanup done here. So, and, and I expect this might change depending on some of the contractors priorities at that time and what's going on with schedule. But we're, we're looking at talking about the main thing that, that's uh, going on out at the Hanford site and that's DF law. Uh, the direct feed low activity waste program. So as we have it scheduled now, Bechtel will be talking about what it is that's going on with the DF law program, uh, the waste treatment plant, things like that, that that's within Bechtel's scope. So uh, the vision is to have uh, uh, Bechtel senior leaders here to talk about what it is that they're working on and give us a, a more broad understanding of what's going on within their scope. And then as we go throughout the board meetings, moving through the year, we'll be doing the same thing with the tank farm with Washington River Protection Solutions, uh, later on down Central Plateau Cleanup Company, et cetera. Uh, any, any questions so far with, with the way we see things uh, written out? anything that I can answer at this point. I've got two people in queue. I've got Dan Solitz and Liz, both both are online. Sure. Dan? Dan Solitz, are you there? Oh, okay. uh, yes, I'm here. I was on my, my own machine trying to find uh, the, the page I wanted to talk about. It's page eight. We can wait till we get down to page eight, uh, or I can talk about it now. Okay, you're on page eight, and we're on four. Let's wait, if you don't mind. No, um, fine. So Dan on page eight. Liz, do you have a question more about where we are? 
Um, yeah, I had suggested edits for page four, but if we're not at suggested edit time, I can wait too. Okay, why don't you go ahead, hug your mic just a little bit. You're a little bit fady. Okay, is this better? Yeah, that's better. Um, so it's page four, paragraph four. It says, um, I'll wait till you get there. Or maybe oh, page four. I'm sorry. I'm a page. Oh, yeah, page five. It's okay. Um, One, two, three, four. Where it says, it says primary members may take a vote on draft advice. And we don't vote on advice. We have a consensus process. So I think it would be more accurate to say may participate in the consensus building process. Um, Okay, for some reason it didn't it didn't do a red line strikeout, so we'll do it this way. Thanks. And then um, I'm gonna fix that. There is oh yeah, I'll let you do that first. Okay, keep going. Um there, I don't it may not be a typo, but it, at the very bottom of the page it says briefers. It says topics and briefers. And I don't know if it meant to say briefings or if it meant, anyway, I wasn't sure. Gary, did you mean topics and presenters or I'm trying to infer? Yes. Is that and a little then, clear? Yeah, I just, I hadn't seen that. I mean, it might be, anyway, um, and then, I've heard from folks on the EIC that if you can scroll up just a little bit, um, it it seems like the only way for the board to really work on advice is to have board work be split between two days. And it sounds like the intent is for if there is advice for that work to be split between two days. But the way it's written here, that's not clear. I'm not sure how to clarify that um, because it seems like the new format is that there is both board work and presentation mixed into two days of meetings. Um, but the way it's written here is a little confusing. Um, I don't know if you could clarify that or if there's a way to make that. So, so, so if I was gonna reframe your question, the current approach is introduce a document on day one and act on potentially approving a document on day two. And so the question is, how does that cadence work with this new proposed timing? Yes, and, and if that is still the intent, how can this language be modified to make it clear that if there is advice, to consider, which there isn't at this meeting, that that would be part of the process. Because the way it's written, it just looks like presentations are one day, board work is the second day. And I don't think that will work if there is something to consider that you introduce day one and um, work on day two. Gary, how does that factor into to this approach? Yes, I, I understand the question, Liz, and, and you're right, there could be some wordsmithing along with that. The intent is to make the afternoon session of day one open to whatever board business needs to be attended to, which could be the first day of introducing advice and, and things like that. So um, you're right, I believe in, in an early draft, the uh, it was just going to be the evening portion. Uh, so yeah, we can we can uh, wordsmith that. That's not a problem. There is room on the schedule to consider and then uh, vote on advice and and build that consensus for advice. <laughs> okay, so maybe yeah, maybe it's just something. And board work meetings for discussion of board business will be um, 
the morning of day one and you know just something like that to add in i don't know what the timing would be but just so it's clear that it can be day one and day two thanks may, may i comment yeah um i think part of the confusion rises from the fact that they are both board meetings and calling for day one the presentation and day two the work meeting um you know maybe you could put that as kind of the subset but that it's board meeting day one presentations and board meeting day two, you know, work, whatever. And in that way, you can easily make some kind of uh, clear um, statement that whenever there is draft advice being considered that it will get its first reading on day one. And certainly we talked about that once before because it takes two days to do that, you know and it needs to have a reading and let people you know add their consensus in you know information and then it gets reworked overnight and then it gets voted on the next day and when we say voted of course we're not really talking about votes um she also mentioned that that we're going to be working on a consensus process but um it has to have a first reading on the first day How about this? Yeah, we'll play with the wording to make sure it's right. The intent is there, the words just don't match up. Right. So I well, understand. I've been, I've been playing with wordings. Jan, what do you think? You're our, you're our wordsmith guru. Can you read what I just typed? I'm sorry to say that without the glasses that I haven't gotten okay. yet. Okay, so what I did in the first paragraph was after presentation meetings, I added a parenthetical that said board meeting day one. The second paragraph, I kind of added board work meetings for discussion of board business, including first and second readings of HAB products like draft advice will be the morning of day one presentation meetings and day two from nine to 11 and one to four. The only recommendation that I would make is to just instead of saying board meeting or presentation meetings that you'd say board meeting day one and then say presentations. Oh, OK. Yeah, because that's when you're going to get your agency in, Whoa. you know, briefings and so on. So what if we OK, I'm going to jump in, Gary. Are you visual imagining that we will not have any presentations on the second day? Likely not. Okay, because that's the way you've got it written. Yeah, the, the way that, that we're envisioning it is it basically the format that we have now, except on day one, we're flipping it, where in most cases, presentations are in the morning. Maybe sometimes we'll have something in the afternoon, but you know, th this is to primarily push the major presentations, the departmental presentations to the evening mm -hmm. to uh, invite the public to, to join. Totally get that. I was just wondering, is the way you've got it written up is that presentations on one day, work on the second day, but if you have a presentation that can't fit on the first day, you're going to want to put it on the second day. So don't limit yourself. Yeah, there is flexibility in, in the schedule. Good comments, and I appreciate okay. all of that. And so, as, as, as I said, that this is built on, uh, in, in, uh, it's firmly encased in Jello. So we've got a lot of flexibility to do what it is that we need to do. Uh, any, any more questions on the wording on the calendar before we hit the? Okay. Uh, I have, uh, sorry, I have one more because there's no mention of public comment periods. And if we're setting this up so that the public can come in, should we make mention of it or not? Um. Thank you. 
Okay, I've got people in queue and I've got people jumping in. So let me recalibrate my poor brain. Um, Dan, you're on page eight. Chris is on page three. So Jan, let's finish yours and then Shelly, you're on this topic, right? Okay, so Jan and then Shelly and then I'm going to the queue. Um, Remind me where we were, Jan, I'm sorry. Whether or not we want to make public comment um, or to you, mention that we are going to have public um, comment since we're making these changes in order for the public to come in. What if I just added all have meetings will include time for public comment in that overall introductory paragraph? Is that that's a little more daring than I normally am, but okay, we're gonna put Richard in queue. Shelly. Well, I don't think it's very daring when you lay out what your expectations are for a meeting. And no, it's me, it's me typing words without y'all <laughs> telling me. <laughs> okay, so I would recommend that just like our board meetings that we have now, we have goals and those goals are for the goals for the meeting and you lay that out. We have a goal right now. This board has a goal to try to get the public involved. To that end, we're changing the times of day so that we can accommodate that. Um, and, and these are also evaluation bullets then because you've either met that criteria or you haven't. And if you haven't met it for a few meetings, then maybe four to eight at night isn't working and you're gonna have to do something different. So you need to figure out what the goals are and and uh, and what the criteria are for meeting those, and then use that as a checklist, and then um, and then also lay out, you know, that you, there's an expectation that there'll be a time for public comment, and what that time will be. So if someone gets off at six o'clock and says, "Geez, you know, public comments at seven fifteen, I can squeeze in dinner and still get there," make it clear to the public what's going to happen when and make sure the agenda is really lined out and that there's also this work component and that work component is what this board has to get done in order to have advice for the next day or you know start getting information on the latest tisker issues or whatever it is um, so that the public understands what to expect, that this is, isn't an opportunity for them to come in and, and have a free for all. There were times in the, in fact, there were the evening meetings here in the past brought in the workforce because it was an opportunity to get before people and talk and this, and that was mainly it. So um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if that could happen again. Do you want that? Is that what this is? And if it isn't, then it should be explained so that people understand. So the public needs to know that there's a body of work that this board has to get done, but there's also the opportunity for them to learn something and that there's also an opportunity for them to weigh in. And I'm sure there's other things. I just can't think of it off the top of my head. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the queue. Dan, you were down on page eight, and that's into, okay, that's into the tables. So we're going to, we're going to wait till we get into the tables for Dan. Um, do not let me forget Dan. Um, that puts us to Chris. Chris, you are on page three. Right. On page three. <coughs> There's a description of what the Budget and Contracts Committee does, and it's fairly incomplete, so I'd like to suggest uh, some additional wording. So, after the words clean up priorities instead of period, have clean up priorities comma, and then the following words, and considers topics related to schedule, scope, cost, and funding of remediation. And I think we ought to have that because we've had two committee meetings where that's been the major topic. 
a couple committee calls where that's been the major topic. And we've summarized have input and submitted it to DOE where schedule, scope, and cost have been the major major comment. So we've done a lot more in the past year than just track our annual cleanup priorities. And I anticipate doing more of the same next year. So I'd like to see that additional wording added. Okay. All right. Where were we, Chris? Richard, are you on this this portion before we get into the table portion? I'm on page five. Okay, go to page page five. Sorry, don't mean to make you all seasick. Okay, where are you on page five? Top of the page, first slide. Okay. Okay, um, you know, we, we said the pick would be on October the 4th, but really it should be pick and welcome aboard to the HAB because this would be the first time we have new members, correct? So I'm thinking that we should we should make it a welcome aboard pick meeting. So something of that nature. I, I don't know how to describe it, but that would be the first time. I mean, because who's going to show up for tank waste? Correct? I mean, you get my drift. We half the board's gone. And you're trying to populate it. So I guess the, the question comes down to is the October 4th meeting, which is the first the first time the new have of whatever's you know is going to come to effect should be a, a welcoming for all have members for the who are all members all have members are members of the pick correct so that's my only suggestion is somehow parentheses welcome aboard all have members type of thing. Richard, I agree with you on that. And all of the committees should be doing something like that to welcome new members. And we the, don't vision, know who they are. the vision <laughs> for the uh, October 19th meeting uh, is to also introduce some of the, uh, the basic, this is what the HAB is, this is what Hanford is, kind of a Hanford 101 type meeting. So you're you're spot on right there. Okay. Well, I, I'm just saying is that I'm I, I'm questioning the two meetings before because of the population, how we populate it. So, sure. Dan so let's let's Gary. Do you want to say any more about this version, this place in the work plan before? We go to Dan. He's he's more in the table table topics, if you will. Sure, and and I think we probably have have uh, gotten through this well enough. So we can then go to page seven. So, okay, page seven. We're close, Dan. We haven't forgotten you. And this this uh, table that you see here basically is a basic listing in very broad terms of what it is that the uh, various committees will be looking at throughout the year. And the numbers in the far left column match dates on the calendar so that we can kind of track to make sure that we're hitting as many of these topics as possible. These topics are written very broadly and that way, as we get closer to the meetings, we will be able to hone in on exactly what within these broad topics uh, we'll be talking about. Some of it will be whatever is on the uh, schedule for the site. Some of it will be potentially any events that may have happened or uh, you know, reaction to something like that. We're also looking at what might the board be interested in at that time. So it's written broadly to be able to account for all of that. Uh, and you know, hopefully, like I said, keep us on track and have those discussions that everybody's been wanting to have. And uh, instead of trying to nail it down to talking about uh, impacts of, of 
three-toed giraffes, we're talking about animals. So that, that's the kind of the intent is to uh, make it as broad as possible. Uh, and, and so each committee, as we go through, uh, you've got your same basic uh, types of, of broad uh, topics throughout. I think this is where Dan's got his question. Yes, can you scroll to page eight, please? Okay. Are you under pick? Under pick, yes. All right, what do you need? Okay, um, we talked about this before, and my objection to this is siloing the, the EJ, the environmental justice, into public relations. And I think it's a really bad optic. And I think that the, the environmental justice parts should come from the specific committees in, on substantial, substantive issues. And then if it's anybody in use, it then goes to the pick and the pick gets, gets the word out. I don't think it should start with the pick and I don't think EJ should be siloed to the pick to begin with. I think it's just a really bad optic. And change the wording to uh, establish an understanding of environmental justice and stakeholder topics after they've been uh, referred by the uh, HAP or the HAP RAP uh, tank waste and budget commit and uh, uh, contracts. Okay, so if I am, okay, so it would, so Steve's got a question on, on your thing, Dan, but I'm going to read what I just typed trying to catch, capture what you said. Establishing an understanding of environmental justice and stakeholder topics after they have been referred from other had HAB committees relevant to the Hanford cleanup mission? Okay. Is that what you were trying to say? Yes, yes. I don't think okay. the pick should be taking the lead on these, these issues. It's the substance should come from the subsidy committees. Okay. Steve Wigman, you're on this topic. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, how are the technical committees informed adequately on environmental justice to initiate conversation back to the PIC? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Well, Bob, um, that, I, have that, that, I mean, my, under, my feeling, my understanding, and from listening to some of the uh, WeJack and MeJack meetings is that these environmental justice issues will be uh, brought up by the members as subsidy uh, uh, issues in when they when they go to these different committees and i can run through some imaginary scenarios but uh, uh don't want to be speaking for the committees dan would it be acceptable to say establishing an understanding of environmental justice and stakeholder topics in conjunction with other HAB committees to buy you some flexibility? Well, these people are being brought on because they already have an understanding of social justice and environmental justice. And so I, it sounds patronizing. And, so, and, 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 and trying to put them in a silo. I mean, if, if if they are indeed there, then they will come from the new members who were chosen because they represent these environmental injustices, or they resent these environmental injustices and, 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 and social equity issues. Is that true? We'll find out. I'm, I'm, see, I'm physically seeing some confusion around the table around 
Is the confusion which direction the issue gets raised? <clears throat> my, my, this is Steve, I'm sorry. My, my confusion is, are we adding people to the board that are specifically knowledgeable about environmental justice so they can bring that knowledge to the individual committees? I was not aware that that was true. And it might be. I, I thought that was the intent of picking these folks. Oh, the difference, I think the, the concepts that are at play are the concepts of environmental justice and diversity and inclusion, and that sure. those things may be related but may not be identical. Well, I guess in the package that was just submitted for approval, are there experts on environmental justice in that package that we can rely on to bring that knowledge to us? I see a head back there shaking and it's a knowledgeable head. It's shaking up and down or sideways? Yeah, come up to the mic, Ginger. <laughs> sideways. I don't know, is it on? Okay. Hey, Dan, it's Ginger. Uh, Hi, I know one applicant uh, works at Heritage College, and I think she's in like an environmental health program um, and one of the professors, so she should have a good background in that. But um, from my look at the candidates, I don't think any of the others have any specific knowledge in that arena. And Esteban Ortiz, who was seated last year, has certainly an understanding of some of the issues, but again, he has he doesn't represent a community that's an impacted community per se. Well, have the impacted communities been identified by the state? Dan, I think we, we're going we deeper maps. than the knowledge yeah. base in the room. Yeah, I mean, there are maps. Okay, well then, the then what do you expect out of the pick committee? On, on this, to, to, to make something out of whole cloth? Gary, can you help clarify the thought behind including an EJ topic with the pick? This is something that is new for the department. And it's also an opportunity for us to learn more from folks who are better versed uh, there, there's, uh, th this is also trying to get information from the pick and other stakeholders who are not sitting around the table to the agencies. Um, th th this is a dialogue if that helps. And, and this is something that's fairly new. I don't know enough about EJ. Uh, th there are, you know, people in this room who are far more knowledgeable than I am at that. And this is a learning opportunity. Uh, how, how exactly a lot of these initiatives are being addressed within the department is fairly new. We're learning as we're going. Uh, like I said, we're, we're trying to learn. Okay, well, do you understand my point about being bad optics to silo it to the public relations committee instead of in the committees that deal with substance. And, and I understand that it's, you know, how, how can we make this better? Because I, I get it there, there, there shouldn't be silos on the board. There should be a lot of information sharing and this can be part of that conversation is how do we do that? I don't you know. Ask in the individual committee. <laughs> so Dan, how does this language strike you? It's under pick. Establishing an understanding of environmental justice and stakeholder topics in conjunction with other HAB committees relevant to the Hanford cleanup mission. Well, I, I, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not a, a, a disadvantage of, of, of a disadvantaged group that I know of, and so I don't know exactly how they would react to it. But from listening in on these other meetings, I think that they would not 
taken well to it. The, 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 it should, should, should come up in the committees of substance, not in the committees of public relations. And so the committees of substance can, can establish an understanding of environmental justice stakeholder uh, relevant to the entry, you know, process. And if the pick can do then assist that, then you should and, and will. Do you have specific words or are you saying you're gonna block consensus on the work plan if we don't fix this? It needs to be fixed. So what that words would fix it? Uh, we'll put that establishment an understanding of environmental justice and stakeholder, uh, stakeholder uh, uh, concerns relevant to the Hanford cleanup mission in the tank waste committee, in river and plateau committee, and in the uh, 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 health, safety, and uh, the H HSAP committee. And it put that up in those committee topics. So you would pull this Instead out of PIC and put it in the technical committees? Yes. Okay. I've got, oh, I got lots of hands on this one. I've got Rob and I've got Jan. So we're going to, apologies to the queue, we're going to stay on this topic. Rob? Dan, it may better fit if you consider it's not a public relations committee. It's a public involvement committee. And that we try to involve the public. And that's how we see this uh, Justice 40 working is how we're going to evolve this into our board. So if we think of it more, like I said, as a public involvement, it fits a lot better. So if I've got a social justice issue and I take it to the public involvement committee, the public involvement committee says, well, okay, we need you to take it to the public and then if the public likes it, we can take it back to its committee of substance. Jan, I, I saw your hand on this issue. Thank you. So I, <clears throat> recommend that we go back to page seven where they have this list of questions and find an appropriate question that calls out environmental justice. In that way, you elicit the information from the committees or the public who are there. And in that way, you can edit what's on page eight that's kind of rankling, first of all, by taking out the parenthetical phrase, including HAB committees, because that will already have been addressed on page seven in all those questions, that laundry list of questions. And um, relating it to topics and activities relevant to the Hanford cleanup mission, well, I noticed that you're asking for advice, so you're kind of framing what you want the advice to address. You want the advice to include what is bubbling up from the committees, and that will happen, But so we can take out that parenthetical part, and I think it will still get to what you want. And then I guess what I'd like for you to elucidate for us is it seems to me that someone else mentioned a oh, white house justice 40 initiatives does that deal with environmental justice is that why we're saying that roberto do you know about the justice 40 or is that a, a doe thing so the justice sorry can you hear me yeah uh, so the justice 40 uh, that comes from the Biden-Harris administration that applies to all the federal agencies. So funding is being provided to do what? Uh, with that regard, I don't have a lot of detail on that. So maybe, maybe funding is being provided to increase diversity? Yeah, it could no, be. It's, it, sorry. It's, in the, it's from the infrastructure, uh, the Build Back, Build Back Better. That money's coming from the Build Back Better. Oh. 
and it's yeah, to, to, to advantage disadvantaged communities, these disadvantaged communities that have already been identified by the state. And so, so do you think somebody that living along somebody living along a road where there's a thousand cars going out every morning and coming back every evening could be identified as a disadvantaged community and someone could say, well, why don't we just put all these people on a bus and then the people living along the road won't have to yeah. breathe this much smoke. You know, it's and just, we just, discussed just that having example. to do with the HOV lanes. But Dan, let me ask you this. Um, making those changes, and I don't know if you can see them on your screen at home, but taking yes. making those changes, will that satisfy what you're looking for? So the first one, are we on page seven now? Eight, I think. We, so we so yeah, let's Jan go back proposed a, a simplifying of number two under pick and an addition of a focus question in the overall focus questions that would apply to all committees. Uh, yes, after concerns, if you add referenced or referred by the other committees because you've got it up there as it as a topic for the uh the the on um, page seven or not a topic but i'm not i can't see page seven so i'm not sure what it's under up there okay i've other committees so i've got steve your cards up on this topic yeah, thank you. I, I'm. I want to back up a minute to the point of I don't think this board understands environmental justice well enough to assign it to any committees. And I think that we should have an educational process of what environmental justice means to DOE and to DOE cleanup so that we can then understand it well enough to figure out what our role in it is. I don't think we're to the point of assigning it to committees yet. I think we're ahead of our headlights. Amber, you're on this question too. And that's what that's what I was gonna recommend. I mean, we have a lot of communities that could come and educate the board um, about how many, you know, over the years, different decisions might have disproportionately impacted different populations. And we should hear from those folks. We could have them here and I think educate the board. And then, you know, but I love Jan's idea about down the road, once we have more of an education, having that be something that's addressed in briefings. How does this decision, you know, through an environmental justice lens, you know, what are the impacts? So I, I love that, I love that suggestion. I don't know if we're there yet, but that could be something down the road. So, you know, for, for once there is a greater understanding and education of the board and quite frankly, you know, leadership. So we're all on the same page and then having that integrated into into briefings. So if right now. Everyone and anyone can be a member of PIC. And we're talking about a single year's work plan. Could for FY23, pick be the committee that hosts that educational effort because all y'all are invited to pick, host the educational effort for FY23 and we add the environmental justice focus question that, that applies to all committees would that get us to agreement on this work plan for this specific year? Well, my preference would be to have the education in, in the presentations to the other committees and the have as a whole, and then the other committees, if they need the assistance of the PIC, uh, refer their issues to the PIC for uh, advice. So then is the other option to delete number two and just leave it in the focus questions? Yes. Yes. Okay. 
Are the agencies okay? I'm going to go to Jan. Are the agencies okay? Because there's this outcome says advice, and just sticking it in the focus questions doesn't totally align. I think that everyone's right that we need to understand more about environmental justice and Justice 40, and that is incumbent on the tri-party agencies to get us up to speed. And then it looks like there is an interest in getting some advice from the PIC regarding how this is going to be done. And I just want to remind people that the PIC committee is not really supposed to be hosting public information events. The PIC is supposed to be advising DOE and the tri-party agencies on how they can do that. So just to be clear. And um, yeah. And then I know that we're not on that page anymore, but it seems to me that there was something that wasn't picked up on page <clears throat> four where we have a two day board meeting, but it's showing up on the work plan as two separate meetings. And so I recommended that we say board meeting day one and board meeting day two, and then describe them, you know, subsequently as um, work meetings and presentation meetings, presentation meetings and work meetings in that order rather than put it out there in such a way that somebody would say, oh, I'm only gonna go to the one that has the presentations because I'm not so interested in the work. <laughs> so I would like it at least to say that it's a board meeting of two day duration so that those people who participate understand that it's uh, set up and designed for everyone's participation for two days. Okay, how about so if this paragraph starts with board meetings are two days, day one presentation meetings are hybrid format, board discussion and action meetings not to mention the fact that we need a quorum on day two for sure if we're going to pass it ice day one present is that oh you can't you can't you i need to give you my glasses sorry so i i redid the First, this introductory paragraph to say board meetings are two day meetings. Day one presentation meetings will be in a hybrid format as conditions allow and will be scheduled in the evening to allow for maximum member and public participation. Day two board discussion and action meetings will be in a hybrid format as conditions allow and will be scheduled during normal business hours. All HAB meetings will include time for public comment. Close. Okay, did we get, Sue? okay, you, thank God you're keeping track of the queue. Okay, so back to, back to Dan. So the, where we left it off with the pick conversation was adding a briefing question she knows who I am on environmental justice so, yeah I, just, I want to throw in an, a possible okay, okay good recognize I'm brand new to the EIC but would it and we we've talked about the merits of holding a briefing or having someone come in and brief us on environmental justice so we could all get smarter and if we're looking for a placeholder for host a briefing for understanding environmental justice, would it be appropriate to put it under the EIC the table? I mean, the EIC would, ho would ostensibly host a presentation to all board membership on environmental justice. 
That sounds good. Becky. Okay. So I tried to keep quiet this whole meeting and I just can't now. <laughs> I'm just trying yes. to miss my opportunity to talk, but I'm going to. Um, that's not normally how the EIC committee works. We don't host presentations for other committees. The EIC gets together to talk about that it's the leadership from each committee it, that makes up the EIC. Steve, Mr. EIC Chair. Yeah, it sounds more like a committee of the whole kind of thing. Um, we're just not ready for this. You know, DOE doesn't know what they're doing. I'm, no offense. <laughs> we don't know what we're doing. Uh, we're, we're kind of blind on this one, and, and it's going to be important for us to understand it correctly. I think that the board should move into this thoughtfully because we don't want to offend folks who are sensitive to what it means when we don't know what it means. And um, I think we just need some outside help. I don't know that I would, I would suggest you put a placeholder in here somewhere that says during the course of the year, we're going to become more enwisened on environmental justice and figure out how to place it in our work plan. I mean, it'd be great to have briefings on technical issues where the effect on environmental justice is one of the one of the uh, framing questions. But if we did that right now, I don't think we'd get anything out of it because I don't think people are ready for it. So what if a framing question was, how does this project or topic relate to environmental justice concerns? That'd be a start. Are you on this one? Yeah, Richard. I'm sorry. I the Q the Q concept is disintegrating a little bit. I just I guess the question comes down to is is there I'd, I'd rather the question be is there a potential environmental justice issue that rather than because then it would give an opportunity for direct I mean the 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 federal guidance on environmental justice is somewhat distorted to say the least it's tied to money to to distribute money i don't think there'll be any real money coming out of this for hanford but it is tied to money is the way they've 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 couched it um and um from a standpoint of if if we see something that could use money to you know to to address the issue that we would we would flag it i mean that would be the only thing see i don't know what you you originally said you wanted advice i have no idea you, you want little bits of advice big advice i mean it's not our normal advice that we would give you correct so you want us to flag environmental justice issues maybe I, us, i'm i'm, I'm asking the question i mean you guys go yeah yeah thank you everyone this has been a great discussion and it continues and i think it will continue um the, I, for me the question is and i'm no expert on environmental justice so let's just put that out there right away but it's about how can this advice benefit uh, the environmental justice program. So let's say, for example, we're working on a piece of advice. Is there a benefit associated with environmental justice? Is is potentially um, those disadvantaged communities somehow benefited by whatever piece of advice they're working on? So that's something that I think would be meaningful, not solely, but, but in part that is explored when we're looking at focus questions. I think we need to learn more about what it is, that, that point has been made clear. I think that information would then help us with some of the decision-making that we have germane to this work program, work plan, work plan. And, and so if, if we could get to a point where 
um, this plan is it, it acceptable in its present form with consensus to the fullest extent we can get great if we can't and this becomes a, a point where we need to know more uh, before we advance it again then we need to do that too thank you amber are you on this topic yes i think we're yeah. um, i'm really glad that everyone it seems like there's consensus that everyone wants to be educated and that we'd have an opportunity to i guess so my question is how does the board get involved in setting up those education sessions, maybe inviting people to come speak to us, um, you know, from disadvantaged communities to talk about what it means to them in environmental justice. So I guess I'm all for doing education. What's the role of the board um, in helping to shape and invite folks to come and um, whether it's a committee of the whole or, or whatever? to come and um, have the have that um, presentation and hopefully some dialogue. So as it works right now, we've got some placeholder dates on the calendar. Look for green dots for either committee calls or leadership calls for the committees. Leadership call meaning chair, vice chair, and a representative of each of the TPA agencies. And those folks work to identify what are the topics and the framing questions for upcoming meetings. So there's, there's a process to weave that in. That's still a committee by committee thing for the committees. It's also what the EIC and the, the HAB leadership does. There's an analogous group, chair, vice chair, three TPA agencies at the board level. Um, so there's, there's a couple of different ways to get into it. Um, in terms of topics and and who who are the best people to talk on those topics, does that help? Right. I, I'm just saying that I would I think there's some board members that would like to give input into that process. So if there's a way to do that, I'm all yeah. good moving forward. Having this be um, identified as an education priority in mm -hmm. our work plan for okay. this next year. Okay. Um, let's see. Well, I, I just clarification. The, the reason I said, is there a potential environmental justice issue? Wouldn't that cue up who we should talk to or invite in? I mean, you, you understand my point. I mean, there's just a lot of issues. Well, I, I know. But <laughs> there's a lot no, of No, 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 but we're on a topic. So I, we're on a yeah. particular topic. I mean, th these questions. We're talking a briefing on a topic, correct? Right. So, so if environmental justice is kind of a lens by which you would look at multiple topics. So no, that's no, but the challenge. But, but, but the committee is in a topic. So we're in a topic. We look out and see if there is a group that that should be queued up. Or not. I mean, I do this in city council all the time. Okay. From the standpoint we are we have a we're we're going to propose something there's a group in the community that should be informed and, and should have their voice heard that's, that's okay the way so let me because i've got other people in queue who've been really really patient in may 2023 on the master work plan there's a committee of the whole pegged for environmental justice that is the topic so it's it's here. If we take and Shelley, I haven't. Are you on this topic, right? Okay. So if Dan's suggestion is that it comes off of the specific t pick topics, there's an addition of a focus question, and there's a committee of the whole with it flagged. Is that getting closer to what you want, Shelley? Thanks, Ruth. I guess I would propose that the full board have a committee of the whole that's focused just on environmental justice. What is it that people are looking at when someone says environmental justice uh, and, and you lay behind that a topic? What is the topic? And so what things do we look at when we're looking through the lens of environmental justice? And work tabletop, one of the cleanup issues out at Hanford, how does that 
environmental justice get reflected in the cleanup decisions for this project and, and do that as a committee of the whole. Um, that will start to give you an understanding of how then, we, we, uh, what are we doing? We're doing cleanup. We're here to weigh in on cleanup. There's really nothing else uh, in terms of, of, of issues other than clean up through the lens of environmental justice. So figuring out what those trigger points are for uh, implementing that and how do you how do you reach people who are potentially uh, impacted? And, uh, and then how does DOE respond to, uh, well, us in terms, this board in terms of the development of advice about how we go about, how DOE, I, that we, I always say we because I feel like this site is mine too, um, but, but how uh, the site decides to go ahead and, in, you know, and implement environmental justice uh, in the cleanup or in the remedy. So, but I would first find out what the heck is out there in terms of discussions that are happening already around the country, and I'm sure there's many. And uh, either take one as a case study and take, you know, and look at it, or and then start to think about what what it would mean if you were to, if this board were to come up with a, a list of four or five. Uh, um, all right. So yeah, earmarks for that, you know, how to implement that. I've got four people in queue in five minutes. Um, okay, Bob, are you on this topic or are you on a different one? Because you've, you've been waiting the longest and I'm feeling guilty about that. I'm on a different topic. Okay, I won't forget you. <laughs> Rob, are you on this topic or a different? this topic and then I also have a couple comments on that but I'll save those but if people remember about three meetings ago we were introduced to a woman Nicole Jean um, at DOE she is the designated lead for the whole um, equity uh, 40 or it's uh, anyway she came in and she gave us a really nice discussion she's heading she had to find out that I still have but she, um, she also said that they're introducing this in DOE and that in the end, she was gonna make sure it gets over all the various DOE sites and that she could come back to us at a later date and talk to us about how they're implementing it uh, DOE wide. And, and I really understand why Gary has, has added this to the system plan because it wants to show we're gonna make some progress here. We're committing to make some progress on, on equity and with our underserved communities. But but we her, her name is Nicole Nelson Jean. Okay. And she came in, it was a half hour presentation, right? Something like that. Um, and, but she did say in the end that she's come back to us and tell us what they're doing. Now, because the, we don't have money to give out, so for example, Franklin County PUD might be submitting a request for Justice 40 through the EPA to get more money for an underserved population in, in Pasco. But they've got to come up with the numbers to, in order to distribute that. It's a little different than what we deal with here with decisions of rods and cleanup and things like that. So, and I think that's what the other DOEC sites are also dealing with. So I just recommend that before we take too many steps off, let's check with her, see if they've made some progress or guidance. I know there were some questions. Some of our uh, members here asked for, is this written down someplace? Can, can we see what the procedures are? And, and so, no, it was too early. Um, this is an executive order out of the administration. So we're, we're giving DOE time to react to it and figure out what to do. So I say we don't really jump off a cliff yet. I think that we all keep aware of it. Um, I do get, once a month, I get a note from EPA telling me to go to a lecture about how to uh, secure um, uh, uh, Justice 40 funds. Um, and so, um, you know, that's my recommendation. On that, and 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 if you want to hear some comments about the work plan, I can give you a really quick. Or do you want to discuss that more? That's fine. 
Okay, so Richard is still on this topic. So Rob, I'm gonna put okay. you back Got in it. the queue. Richard? I was just gonna suggest change the word issue to aspect. All right. It's All right. a fuzzy word. <laughs> All right. So where am I? Thank you, Shelly. Shelly on this topic? Okay. Faked us out with a name card. So I've got three people in queue, and we're going to wrap this up, and then we'll know what we're going to do in the morning. I have Bob, Chris, and Rob. And thank you for waiting. I know it's been a messier queue than normal. Okay. This is me? It's you. Oh. Okay. A different topic completely. Um, if you go back to page five and six, um, you'll, you'll see that Gary tried to put uh, under each committee, like at the first one, October 5th, Tank Waste Committee, TWC2. Now, the way the committees work, at the end of our meetings, we usually gather around and decide what are the things that are still bothering us and what do we need to know more about? And we give that list of topics to Gary and he goes off and he struggles and tries to figure out who would be the best person to give it, uh, gets him to put together a presentation goes back to headquarters, and by the time the next tank waste committee comes around, it's not ready. So when you see these in parentheses, this is a commitment from DOE saying that ahead of time, they're going to work on putting together, in the case of October 5th, tank integrity and retrievals update. So they're going to start early, de determine the whole path, get all the approvals, and have that ready for that meeting. So it's kind of a, a step that we haven't had in the past. This is a commitment that we're going to have a, at least one presentation on those topics. Now, I take it that if there are other things the committee still wants to talk about, uh, we will continue to request that, and hopefully uh, Gary or whoever the coordinator is will make it happen. But uh, when you read these, it is uh, a commitment, and I think that's a key difference from past work plans. So am I correct, Eric? Did I say that right? Very close. <laughs> What we're trying to do is create a predictable roadmap so that this also goes to my uh, SMEs so that we can plan that to make sure that you know, what we've got uh, is, is going to be available for that time. And if not, we've got plenty of time to be able to shift to present when something is right. So th this, this is a strong roadmap and we believe we will be able to pretty much hit most of these marks. But as, as we said early on, firmly in jello, uh, depending on other conditions that I can't predict at this moment, but we're gonna do our best to meet this. Okay, thank you. All right, Chris. Yes, Ruth, could you go to page eight, please? Eight. Okay, Chris. Hug that mic so we can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, that's good. Okay. I'd like to add two topics to the Budget and Contracts Committee, but rather than take up time here, could I just email them to you right after we uh, end the meeting here to you and Gary, and then you can add them and we can look at them tomorrow morning? Um, why don't you why don't we do both um read them what they are now so people have a sense of where your head is and okay number three yeah prime contracts 101 
Okay. Dis discussion and information. Um, no, for action, it would be discussion and outcome would be information. Oh, okay, thank you. And the and other number, one? Number four would be work breakdown structure. Project baseline summary, comma, yeah, comma, and control accounts. Discussion and information. Okay. So. And I guess what you could do after accounts, you could put as related to budgets and funding. Okay. So the reason for doing this is because everybody's going to take this overnight and consider what can and cannot be done. So I wanted people to hear that um, so they can think about it. Um, Rob, you've been awfully patient. Thank you. Thanks. Um, on page three, I would really like to add under the tank waste committee, uh, tank integrity as a um, a principal responsibility. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. On page okay. three. Yeah. Page right. three. Storage retrieval. So tank waste committee. Storage right. retrieval treatment. Disposal. Supplemental treatment. Where would you stick the oh, word? Just after supplemental treatment, tank integrity, okay. et cetera. You know. The the other is um is in the budgets and contracts. Um, do they still claim the system plan uh, reviews and work with the system plan? That certainly should be described in at least one of these committees. And I think it's the budgets and contracts that have been leading the charge on system plan. Oh, that was us? Yeah. Okay, stick it in the tank. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. That's a big one. Yeah, okay. Okay, and then um, and then further back, uh, it, when we start talking about um, health and safety, you know, those are pretty nebulous discussions there. I, I think that we, we're owed something on vapors and asbestos, beryllium, um, things of that sort. Um, it's been many years since we've had a, a recent reporting of, uh, you know, how we're doing in that activity and especially in our D&D activities. So I think that that's under health and safety. So I would just add number two, or actually number four, would be uh, re, uh, condition assessments on uh, vapors, tank vapors, and then another one saying assessment on uh, asbestos slash beryllium, or uh, there, there was some, Mike's not here right now, but. What okay, was, Rob, I am I am lost as to where you are because you're talking faster than my brain is working. Okay, in, in on page seven. Oh, you're down on page and, seven. That's yeah, why on, I'm confused. And safety, and Sorry about that. And nowhere do I see anything about asbestos or vapors. And it used to be a very strong activity under health and safety. Okay, so you're wanting to and, and maybe well, Becky. Could I, I think it's something. under one, basically. Worker health and safety and health, including traffic safety. Yeah, when we went through it at the leadership workshop, it was, we, you know, we threw those out and it's kind of all encompassing, but I did want to have including traffic safety added into there. Because um, originally, yes, they had it under tank, right. under or the, the tank. We, it was a joint committee uh, topic. And so I think it's all encompassing the way it is, but and I and I thought that I kind of made that clear at the leadership workshop that that was something that you know we still wanted to have on our work plan and our right, right. In our radar. Okay. Do you think it would be better to just list a few of those important ones? Well, I thought it would be important to list them all, but okay. <laughs> um, I got overruled. All right. So. We don't understand. want to be limited. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I understand. No, that's the that's just the comments I had on the work plan. 
Thank you. Okay. Okay. Let me. Chris, you have your hand up, and then I want to sort of summarize where we are because there's been a lot in the chat. I got to catch up on Chris. I don't remember why I had my hand up. Oh. Um, it it was. Uh, oh, I think the I, I think the system plan uh, is more appropriate to be uh, discussed in the tank tank committee rather than budgets and contracts. Or it could be joint because there is a lot of cost and schedule in there, but it's probably still more more appropriate to for the tank waste committee to take the lead. Okay. And I put I put the system plan under tank waste. Yeah. Okay. So we're into overtime. We've got some proposed edits here to the work plan. The way we do this is overnight, we clean this up for you so you can see it first thing tomorrow. Actually, we'll probably email it out tonight. Um, and then the agencies can consider that. You can consider it. The folks who are dialed in can consider it. We didn't get to the color calendar today. We can talk about that tomorrow and how this stuff then fits into the proposed schedule. Um, and then we will ask for your consensus approval in the morning for the work plan and calendar. Um, given the, the fact that the, the new membership package probably won't be approved before fall, having this approved at this meeting, if it's acceptable to you, would really help us on the back end planning for fall meetings without it without a schedule and a calendar and topics, it gets really hard to support committee meetings. So that's why this is before you in June. This is a little earlier than normal, um, but that's why. So that tactically we can still support you. Steve, do you have any final words before we adjourn? I just want to thank everybody for being here in person today. Those few who are actually here in person. I'd like to encourage everyone who is local to show up tomorrow in person so we don't have to try to figure out what you're saying over these weird microphones. Uh, we need to move forward into um, this next iteration of in-person meetings successfully. And the best way to do that is to have some new habits like showing up. So if, if you're local and you can do it, Tomorrow, please come so we can see your smiling face. Uh, appreciate the conversation today. The HAB has a lot to do, and um, it's going to be important to keep a progressive outlook on the future. And appreciate the diligence of everyone who has set up these opportunities to meet and of course, we all appreciate the interactions we've had with each other as we've been allowed to be participants in the HAB. And uh, so have a good evening and see you tomorrow. Thanks.